since they have bills and other committees and get through with those introductions, et cetera. Um, also assisting us today are our committee pages, Morgan Baird from Gehring, who is a political science major at UNL, and Tessa Menke from Glenville, who is a business and law major at UNL. This morning, we will be hearing three bills and we'll be taking them in, up in the order listed outside the room. On the table in the side of the room, you will find blue testifier sheets. If you're planning to testify today, please fill one out and hand it to the pages when you come up. This will help us to keep an accurate record of the hearing. If you do not wish to testify, but would like to record your presence at the hearing, please fill out the gold sheet in the back side of the room. Also, I would note the legislature's policy that all letters for the record must be received by the committee by noon the day prior to the hearing. Any handouts submitted by testifiers will also be included as part of the record as exhibits. We would ask if you have any handouts that you please bring 10 copies and give them to the pages. If you need additional copies, the pages will be able to provide them for you. Testimony for each bill will begin with the introducer's opening statement. After the opening statement, we will hear from any supporters of the bill, then from those in opposition, followed by those speaking in the neutral capacity. The introducer of the bill will then be given the opportunity to make closing statements if they wish to do so. We ask that you begin your testimony by giving us your first and last name, and please also spell those for the record. We will be using a three minute timer light system today. When you begin your testimony, the light on the table will be green. The yellow light is your one minute warning. And when the red light comes on, we will ask you to wrap up your final thoughts. And we've been kind of a stickler on that in here. So we've started that, so we will continue that. I will like to remind everyone, including senators, to please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. And with that, we will begin today's hearing with LB 328 and Senator Rabel. Welcome to your Judiciary Committee, Senator Rabel. Well, good morning, colleagues. And thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. And thank you so much, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jane. Raybold, and it's spelled J-A-N-E. Last name is Raybold, R-A-Y-B-O-U-L-D. I represent Legislative District 28 and appear before you today to introduce LB 328. LB 328 would create the Office of Liaison for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons. As you can see in the bill, Section 1 directs the Nebraska Attorney General to establish this office and staff it with a full-time specialist. The specialist in this role will serve as a liaison among local, state, tribal, and federal entities involved in reporting or investigating missing and murdered indigenous persons cases in Nebraska. So I'm gonna go over the mechanics and then I'll give you lots of details. Section one, Subsection three of the bill describes the duties of this specialist, which includes, but is not limited to, identifying, collecting, and directing resources and information to aid in combating the prevalence of missing and murdered indigenous persons in Nebraska. Synthesizing information regarding missing and murdered indigenous persons from state, local, tribal, and federal law enforcement entities involved in such cases, aiding in communication among such entities and reporting information to tribes, communities, the media, and the public as appropriate to aid in locating missing and murdered indigenous persons. And consulting and coordinating with the Commission on Indian Affairs regularly in the course of the specialist duties. In order to carry out these duties, the bill calls for an appropriation of general funds to the Attorney General. The fiscal note reflects the salary and benefits for the specialist role totaling $106,049 in fiscal year 2023 and 2024 and 109,504 in the following year. It also lists 10,000 per beginning in fiscal year 2023 and 2024 <laughs> to the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs for costs associated with travel for agency staff in support of the Office of the Liaison for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons. How did this all get started? 
In 2019, Senators Tom Brewer, Tim Greger, Patty Pansing Brooks, and others introduced <laughs> LB 154, and I, oh, we're not supposed to use props, but hopefully we will be emailing you that report of LB 154 to each of the judiciary members. This report required the Nebraska State Patrol in collaboration with the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs to produce a report on the number of missing Native American women and children in Nebraska and identify barriers to reporting. Governor Pete Ricketts signed the bill into law on March 6, 2019. The report raises needed awareness of the potential interrelatedness of missing persons to human trafficking and other social challenges and lists steps that the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs would undertake to improve the response to missing Native women and children within the state of Nebraska. I was truly honored when Judy Geishkabos from the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs approached me about introducing legislation to establish the Office of Liaison for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons. This legislation is one small step that we can take that has big potential in improving the response to missing Native persons within Nebraska. If you haven't read the report, <laughs> like I said, we will be emailing it to every member of the judiciary. What I wanted to say is that many task forces across the United States and other states that surround Nebraska have already implemented this type of person, specialist, and office. So just to, to throw out a few other states that have done it, Washington has, Arizona, Montana, North and South Dakota, uh, and Colorado recently implemented this as well. While LB 154 directed the study toward missing Native American women and children, the data showed that Native American males are overrepresented among missing persons in Nebraska when looking at the distribution of age and sex of missing persons and missing Native persons. Nearly two thirds of Native American missing persons are boys aged 17 years or older. The research indicates that Native American persons experience crime victimization at higher rates than non-Native people and that violence against Native women and children is of particular concern. Native American women are also murdered at an extraordinarily high rate, more than 10 times the national average on some reservations. Native youth experience violent crime rates up to 10 times the national average, with violence serving as the factor in three quarters of deaths of Native American adolescents and young adults between the ages of 12 and 20. Due to the disparities and violent victimizations concentrated in Native American communities, national attention has focused on the problem of missing and murdered Native women and children in the United States. The report helps us understand the challenges of counting missing persons. What I'm about to share is a mix of the report itself and other items that are directly related. Missing persons cases are dynamic. Most missing persons are missing for a short period of time and the number of missing person cases in any jurisdiction may change on a daily basis. Other challenges in ascertaining an accurate picture of missing persons include inconsistent reporting, policies, and definitions. Reporting to law enforcement agencies and accurate data entry by these agencies is critical, it's crucial. However, some law enforcement agents may not enter a case into various data systems, both the Nebraska system and the national system, because they believe the case will be resolved, they believe the case doesn't constitute a missing persons case for some reason, or they are unaware or unmandated to enter missing persons cases especially adults, into certain data systems. Furthermore, the lack of standardization in the definition of missing person, lack of protocols or policies in reporting and investigating these cases, and the lack of standardization regarding who is considered a youth and thus federally mandated to report or adult varies across states. 
These challenges regarding reporting and investigating missing persons may be exacerbated among Native American missing persons primarily due to jurisdictional issues, a lack of coordination and relationships between tribal and non-tribal law enforcement agencies, and racial misclassification when entering the cases in the databases. First, jurisdictional issues between tribal and non-tribal law enforcement agencies may convolute the reporting process, where Native American community members must decide to whom they should report the case, who they trust. The data from the report suggests that there is much confusion from Native American community members about which agency is the rep appropriate reporting agency. This issue is tied strongly to the second problem, which is that tribal and non-tribal law enforcement agencies may not agree on which agency should investigate the missing person case. This might be complicated by several issues, including whether the missing person is a member of a tribe, whether the reporter is a member of a tribe, whether the missing person was living on tribal lands, and where the missing person is su suspected to be, particularly whether they are suspected to be on or off tribal lands. In many cases, it may be that tribal and non-tribal law enforcement agencies need to jointly coordinate the case investigation. <laughs> but the informal or formal relationships are not in place to facilitate the communication and coordination that is needed to accomplish this collaboration. Finally, the race and or tribal affiliation of the missing person may be unclear, leading to potential underreporting or misclassification of native missing persons. So what I, we've known from the other states is that that missing persons uh, of tribal members are one of the most underreported of missing persons. The point about underreporting due to misclassification stands out to me. A total in the report of 498 missing persons were identified at a point in time. So using the 2019 census data population estimates for Nebraska, Nebraska's per missing person rate on March 31st, 2020 was 25.7 per 100,000 persons. So I'm a businesswoman, I love data, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to overwhelm you, but some of the numbers that came forward from the report indicated the majority of the missing persons in this snapshot were white, 66.9%, uh, followed closely by African American, which was 19.7%, and then in third place was Native American at 4.6%. But what the shocking statistic that jumped out to me right away that I latched onto was that 8%, 8% of the entries for missing persons list the race as unknown. So you can imagine if you would take that 8% and put it directly in the Native American category, that would be a significant increase, which would substantiate a lot of the data from the other states, indicating that the missing persons is underreported. So we also know that there is a disproportionate number of Nebraskans reported missing persons are Black, 3.9% times their population, and Native American, 3.1 times their population. The data also revealed that not all of Nebraska law enforcement agency have a missing persons policy. So out of the 212 law enforcement agencies contacted for this report, only 51 responded. And out of those 51 that responded, those 51 agencies, responded only 16 had missing persons policies and guidelines to help them clearly identify individuals and provide the critical data to help locate or track and follow these missing persons. The final barriers to reporting and investigating missing person, missing Native American persons that I'm going to share came from the community listening sessions with members of the Ponca, Santee Sioux, Winnebago, and Omaha tribes. The most prominent theme, which was reported at all four listening sessions, 
was that the community members simply did not have a clear understanding of how and when to report a missing person. Closely aligned with this was confusion regarding whether they should report the missing person to law enforcement, tribal or non-tribal, or a social service agency such as DHHS. Additionally, community members reported that there was a lack of communication between the different law enforcement agencies as well as poor communication between law enforcement and tribal communities, particularly in regard to missing persons cases. The report highlights several other challenges, but I believe that I've shared enough with you at this point to illustrate the need and benefit for creating the Office of Liaison for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons. So in the report, they have a full page of recommendations and actionable items, but I'm just gonna hit on three top ones. The first one is Nebraska State Patrol and tribal and non-tribal law enforcement cooperation needs to be increased. Number two, we need to enhance the awareness of reporting options and mechanisms to the Native American communities. And thirdly, we need to be aware of the potential interrelatedness of missing persons to human trafficking and other social challenges. The green copy of the bill, which lists the duties that I mentioned at the beginning of my opening, go a long way to begin to bridge the gaps that exist in helping to improve the response to missing Native persons within Nebraska. I want to thank you all very much for your time and attention, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Senator Rabel? Senator Blood. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. Um, thank you for bringing this forward, Senator Rabel. I have one clarification and a question. Sure. So during the presentation, and I'm say, I'm not saying this to like embarrass you. I'm saying this to make sure it's right on the record. Yes. Um, you had said boys age 17 and older, but isn't it 73.3 percent were age 17 and younger in the report? I I may have misspoke about the age, but that it's was a surprising younger, right? detail that came out from the report that it was missing young males. And the report went on to say that it could be because of abuse and ne neglect. It could be a because of depression or other issues of poverty uh, that they see on the reservation. But but am I correct in saying it's 17 and younger, not 17 and older, right? Because you said 17 and older. And I remember I think reading the report and I thought it was 17 and younger. I think you're correct. I'd have to okay. pull it up again that, that's, to find that It's spot. like 73.3%, right? It was a shocking number of 73.3%. I was surprised also that yeah. it was um, mostly young boys. Um, and I'm sure trafficking plays a a big role in part of that as well. Um, and then you had noted 4.6% of our population is uh, Native American as far as, um, excuse me, 4.6% were reported as being Native American in uh, the list of those who were missing with 8% unknown. Um, while I thought was interesting, only isn't only 1.5% of our population in Nebraska Native American? So 4.6% of 1.5% is a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's 3.1%, 3.1 times more than the population. And it, we also saw the same thing for the African American population. Missing persons indicated 3.9% times that population. Um, so it is, but the, the thing that I latched on was that 8% of unknown. Right. And that goes right to the problem of there are no guidelines and clear direction. I know Lincoln Police Department and Omaha Police Department have <coughs> clear guidelines and that I know that they would be willing to share with all the other agencies to help come up with more consistent methods of really tracking in both the Nebraska system as well as the national system. So I agree with the tracking and everything you said today, but how do we make agencies who are traditionally not really cared about these demographics start caring? Well, we know that there's um, one of the elements in the report. They wanted to have additional cultural awareness training for many of the agencies across the state of Nebraska to help raise that awareness and how better to approach different uh, the communities and how to interact with the communities in a more appropriate way. One of the 
the action items that they had requested would be like a cross deputization of the tribal officers and the state patrol so that they could have worked more effectively and efficiently together on uh, responding quicker to a lot of these issues and also trying to collect the data in a more appropriate fashion, in a clearer fashion, uh, with better guidelines. And wouldn't you say that until we can move to a place where no matter who's missing, where they come from, what they look like, what color they are, how they identify, until we treat everybody like human beings, period, we're never going to get justice for any of these people? I think that is a fair statement to make, but we recognize that this individual, this specialist, will be a big part of helping work with the cultural differences and raising cultural awareness. We envision that this individual will be traveling throughout the state of Nebraska, um, continuing with listening sessions, but including law enforcement agencies so that they work, can work collaboratively and cooperatively together on looking at these missing persons in a different way and how to treat them in compliance with the standards that other law enforcement agencies are using to help them better identify and, and recognize they can be doing it better despite maybe some of their cultural differences that they have or lack of awareness. We know that the specialists will go a long way in, in help bridging this huge de deficiency and gap uh, to making sure that we have better better reporting statistics, but more importantly, that we jump on these missing individual cases quicker and have a better response to solving them and, and locating them. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Senator Decay. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. Senator Rabel, a um, couple quick questions. Um, the other states that have these type of agencies, are they one-person agencies that would we're proposing um, here today, or are they? You know, I, I can't answer that question. If they have just one individual that takes it on, I didn't dig down deep enough into to their policies that they have implemented. But I know that it was important enough for these agencies that, that have tribal members to take on this task. So I, I, I can get back to you with that information. And the other, this person that we're suggesting hiring for this agency in Nebraska, would they um, act as almost like an investigator trying to bring up information? Are they going to act <coughs> or try to provide a go-between between tribal police and state police and county police well, and sheriffs? We, we hope they act in both capacities. What I would say more a facilitator in outreach um, to law enforcement agencies is number one, getting a uniformity in guidelines and standards in reporting, in reporting missing individuals, and certainly being a, a go-between between the tribal authorities and having the authority to do so under the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General office does have a human trafficking experts, but they need to work in collaboration because of some of the cultural deficiencies that we are seeing and an under-reporting of the Native American individuals who are missing. So it's under the Attorney General's office that they would have the, the authority to work in collaboration with law enforcement and have the authority to do so, but also be able to coordinate with the tribal authorities to kind of be that liaison and facilitate some of the mistrust that the tribal authority individuals have with law enforcement so that they can respond better and quicker to missing persons. Thank you. Any other questions for Senator Raybould? I don't see any. Thank okay. you. Are you Thank staying around to close? I certainly will. Okay, let's have our first proponent testifier. Welcome to your judiciary. Hi, good morning. My name is Cheyenne Robinson. I serve as the secretary for the Omaha tribe of Nebraska. It is important for me to be here today to speak on behalf of my tribal citizens on such a sensitive but significant issue. By now, we all heard of the case of the missing and murdered Gabby Petito. 
But chances are you probably haven't heard of the disparity of a young mother on the Omaha Indian Reservation whose life was taken too soon back in 2020. Indigenous relatives all over the country go missing every day and you never hear about it in the news. But this is nothing new in Indian country. Throughout history, Indigenous people have been disproportionately impacted by violence in the United States. In addition, addressing MMIP issues in Indian country is particularly challenging due to the confusion, confusion as mentioned earlier, surrounding jurisdiction, lack of coordination, and inadequate resources. With that being said, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska is in support of LB 328. Not only is it important for tribes and indigenous organizations organizations to have a direct point of contact with the state officials, but it is even more important for public safety organizations to be culturally aware of how tribes and indigenous organization, organizations operate. I recently searched the Nebraska State Patrol missing persons list last night, actually. Currently, there are 45 active cases of missing Native Americans, 19 of which of those are from Omaha Indian Reservation and the Winnebago Indian Reservation. I have been in office since 2021, and unfortunately, I've only seen and heard of or heard from the Attorney General once, and have only seen and heard from the Nebraska State Patrol leadership once. Generally, there's a lot of animosity between tribal citizens and law enforcement, but having that office can, that can understand and assess time-sensitive cases could quickly bring together tribal county and state officials to work as one, and also, most importantly, bridge that gap. The state of Nebraska can support this bill and assist tribal citizens by having tribal consultations, gathering data specifically related to the tribes of Nebraska, developing creation of MMIP work groups, increasing collaboration and communication with all law enforcement agencies within the state of Nebraska, specifically adopting a standard of operating procedure on how they would assist missing and murdered indigenous persons once they receive the notification. But most importantly, the office of liaison for missing and murdered indigenous persons should have a director with a whole holistic understanding of how our culture, traditions, and kinships play a role in our everyday lives and how domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health challenges, and poverty con contributes to missing and murdered indigenous persons. When reading the bill, I see that indig indigenous descent preference is at a forefront of it. From this position, we expect community connection and vetting from the indigenous communities who know to know if in this individual has done good work in indigenous community communities or is even connected to the community at all. Who better than our own homegrown diverse tribal citizens to advocate for the missing and murdered indigenous persons. Also gonna, consider I'm individuals. Gonna to, sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you because the red light is on, but I'm sure you'll get a question. But first, could you spell your name because we didn't get it for our records. Yes, sorry. Um, Cheyenne Robinson, spelled C-H-E-Y-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. Robinson? I don't see any. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'll note for the record that Senators Eibach and Holdcroft have uh, joined us. And guys. Vice Chair DeBoer, members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, my name is Don Wesley, B-O-N-W-E-S-E-L-Y, and I'm here as a lobbyist on behalf of the Winnebago Tribe. Um, first, I want to thank Senator Raybould for introducing this legislation, and as she uh, outlined in her testimony, uh, there, the study that was done um, by previous Senator Pansing Brooks and others uh, showed the need, the problem. And so the question now is what to do about it. So that's what I'd like to focus on, on on this testimony. And I am actually here on behalf of the chair of the Winnebago Tribal Council, uh, Victoria Kitchen. Uh, I'm going to go back in time to 1990 when I was a member of the legislature and introduced uh, LB 886. And it was passed and it dealt with uh, the, the title was the Attorney General Crimes Against Children Act. And what we did is we set up a special unit within the Attorney General's office to prosecute child abuse and other crimes against children. And we did it because there was a problem with county attorneys and smaller counties dealing with very complex and very difficult child abuse uh, cases. And uh, the feeling was they needed help. And so a unit was set up at the Attorney General that was available depending on the county at their request would come in and help prosecute child abuse cases. It was very successful, and, and uh, um, it, it's an example of how 
the state working with the counties and local police and the federal government uh, can accomplish something when there's a serious problem. Well, now that serious problem is the MMIP uh, issue. And uh, this proposal to set up a liaison within the attorney general's office, I think, is exactly the right uh, solution because you do have many jurisdictions. You have federal authorities involved. You've got the state patrol and the attorney general's office. You've got county attorneys. You've got local police. So somebody whose only job is focusing on trying to address this problem, bringing those people together could be very effective and I think cost efficient way to deal with this and to finally do something about this problem that we've known about now for several years. So um, I'm here to support the legislation. The Winnebago tribe is very su supportive of trying to do something about this problem and would appreciate your support for this uh, legislation. All right, are there any questions for this testifier? Senator Decay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wesley, I didn't, it, if you can answer the question, maybe Senator Raybill can in our closing. With the uh, states that have implemented these agencies, um, do you have a percentage of the success rate that they have after they, these uh, were implemented? And, how far back they have been and how many years they have been in service already? I think that's an excellent question. I don't have the answer to that, but I know uh, Judy Gosprigosh will be testifying after me, and she's very familiar with what other states have done. So then, thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? Senator Geist. Thank you for your testimony. I just have a quick question of, would this um, liaison be forward-looking and backward-looking? So it would look at old cases and current cases? Well, I'll tell you in, in the example that I gave, uh, there were pending cases that they immediately got involved with, and then from that point forward. So if, I would think they would do both because there are missing persons out there. They've got the list. They know who's, who's missing. And I would imagine they would immediately start looking at that list and trying to see what they can do to make some progress on addressing those. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. <coughs> Welcome to your Judiciary Committee. I'm Pinky J, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Marian Holstein, and I cannot confirm that I was the first female Native American Deputy Sheriff you, of Monterey you, County, California. Can you spell your name for us? Sorry, can you spell your name for us? I'm sorry, I apologize. That's all right. M-A-R-I-A-N-H-O-L-S-T-E-I-N, just like the cop. And, uh, but they did not keep this data back then. But what I can confirm is that Monterey County lost the first female Deputy Sheriff in the line of duty, Jerry Jacobitz. And it's, a, it's a, an experience I carry with me every day. There are several components to the tragedy of missing and mur murdered indigenous persons. I am indigenous, so I know the, the suffering families experience and it is debilitating. There are several websites with information about, um, about this tragedy. But what I hope for is the establishment of an office of liaison for murdered indigenous persons. Law enforcement understands first contact in investigation is critical. However, if this is conducted by officers with little to no empathy for people of color, it lessens that probability of that case being solved. Our people are already distrustful of a government and people who have carried out and continue to carry out inhumane policies that demonstrate no one has learned from the past. We have always petitioned for indigenous people serving indigenous people, and this is no exception. What I want to address today and what I can share about this problem is the firsthand knowledge of the human element, the law enforcement officer. At times it amazes me, no one speaks of the educational levels of officers uh, out from uh, a quick search found of the 54 largest cities 
in America, approximately 38 have minimum requirements of a high school diploma or GED. And if these people get through the academy, then they are on the streets. I have always wondered how anyone could turn loose the John Wayne types, the types who probably were bullied as adolescents and are aiming to finally exert their authority, power, and get even. Were there no psychological screenings or further vetting? And I think we see that today that there probably wasn't. Of course, there are the multitudes of, uh, of excellent law enforcement officers, and I salute them and wish them more pay. But my point is we release officers with, le with less than a college education and more, most likely with no sociology or human courses on a trusting public. Thank you. Th Thank you very much, and thank you for monitoring the light system. Let's wait and see if there's a question for you. Are there any questions for this testifier? Well, well, I have a couple. Did you, I'm sorry I interrupted you at the beginning to get your spelling. Um, did you say that you were a sheriff's uh, deputy? Is that what you said? Or Deputy Sheriff Monterey County. Okay. And how long were you doing that position? Three years. 1979 I started, so that's why I said way back. Yeah, okay. And do you... Do you think that this um, this liaison position, you've seen sort of firsthand how it all works. Do you think that that would help to, to be a kind of a go-between between, between mm -hmm. other law enforcement agencies <laughs> and tribal law enforcement agencies? Do you see that working? Yes, because a person has to know that community and those resources and agencies that are there. And they have to have that working relationship. You know, as I mentioned, we still, to this day, have, we don't have that much trust in, you know, government officials. So, uh, so having someone there who relates to the culture, mm -hmm. who relates to how we feel as Native, as Indigenous people, and how we interpret that world, it's, an, it's, a, it's critical, it's important. What characteristics would you say Assuming we pass this legislation uh, and we're looking for this liaison person, what characteristics do you think would help them to most succeed? Well, of course, knowledge of the law, mm -hmm. knowledge of that governing responsibility so that we know who to go to when things aren't working right, and um, the truthfulness mm -hmm. because, you know, we come across in really in any work situation, you know, we come across uh, areas of improvement that we see that we need to voice our opinion on. But oftentimes, you know, uh, it's a matter of politics or whatever that, you know, you know, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want this person to think worse of me, etc. So we need a brave person also who's okay. going to really speak up and give us the facts. I think that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Senator Takei. One quick one. Um, so would this person be working across the state or working within the tribal boundaries of the reservation? I guess my question is, they would have more of a at-home knowledge of families and uh, circumstances that might contribute to these cases or if they're traveling across the state, they may not have that uh, local knowledge of, you know, the cases that are impending. So I was just curious on how that will all work out. Well, this, as you know, is a problem that has been with us for decades. Um, so I would encourage them to read up on the history. Um, you know, Canada has been for, um, ringing the bell for, for a long time. And um, this, this individual, I believe, would have to have that ability to interpret and synthesize everything that we have learned so far and apply it. Um, and in the, you know, when we're doing investigating, we always sort of look towards the abstract. And I didn't put it in my testimony, but I, I have this, very far out there idea that um, 
you know, with the human trafficking that is occurring today, and we know that a lot of it may be from, you know, other countries, you know, if they've seen that, how we investigate missing indigenous women, 12, you know, women in general seem like they're fair game. And, you know, why do we, and here we are today with this terrible human trafficking. Thank you, Senator Decay. Other questions? Thank you for being here. Good evening. Next proponent testifier. <coughs> My name is Grace Johnson. I am a therapist, drug and alcohol counselor. I'm an enrolled member of the Ogallala Lakota Sioux Tribe. I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I've worked with tribal agencies on and off the reservations. I, um, I want to reiterate what our previous person had said and, and advocate for this position to be made, please. Um, working with native communities, you definitely need to have them in and I would advocate that the person in this position be indigenous, be Native American. Native American communities have that history of, like was said earlier, that there is a large distrust there. So it's almost a closed community. You need somebody who understands the culture, somebody who knows how to come in and talk to people and, and how to, what families to work with. The other portion that I want to reiterate too is that Native women are fair game. It's, the issue of MMIP has gotten to be a large national issue. And it's known now that if there's a crime committed on most tribes, they can't be prosecuted. <clears throat> Non-Native tribal members are not prosecuted in many of these places. And so we need that advocate. We need somebody to, to stand up and say, there is going to be law investigation looking into this at some level that we, we have somebody to protect us. So I'm advocating for this position. I'm advocating for all of this work. Uh, we definitely need somebody who can go in and be advocate for us, who can work with the agencies, who can bring up the issues, who know how to talk to people. Um, Gabby Petito was brought up. In her investigation, nine bodies were found because nobody was looking for the other people that were had gone missing. So there's just, um, we need somebody to advocate for us. We need help. We need that if that makes any sense <laughs> what i have just said but working between uh, working on and off the reservation i've seen the jurisdictional issues i've seen what it, it takes to get people to coordinate between county state tribal patrol federal i believe i said what four different districts right there um and when you when you don't get people coordinating at those four levels on every level, city, county, state, federal, and none of them are working, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to have what we have right now. We're going to have this situation happening nationally, which it is. And Nebraska was in the report saying that we have one of the highest numbers of missing indigenous people in the nation. Is anybody proud of that? I mean, this, this committee here, this is what you guys need to be working on. We are one of the most vulnerable populations. We are your citizens of Nebraska. Help us. That's all I got to say. Any questions? Thank you. Can you can you spell your name for the record? Grace Johnson, G R A C E J O H N S O N. Thank you. Are there questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you. Next testifier. Good morning, Senator DeBoer, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kent Rogert, K-E-N-T-R-O-G-E-R-T, -E -E and I'm here representing the Tonka Tribe of Nebraska in support of LB-328. Uh, I'll just reiterate the comments of uh, Mr. Wesley and those that were before us. This is, uh, I, I think if, if you look at something that has an anagram already, MMIP, we're beyond time of dealing with the, the issue at hand. It's time to, to talk seriously about um, what's going on. The Ponca tribe is uh, unique 
to Nebraska with the, because we don't have a reservation. We have service areas. So they lack the support system and our members are scattered across the state. So they, there is a, sometimes a disconnect between where people are and where they aren't. And so you, you have some issues uh, keeping, you know, with reporting where they might be missing or not. Um, Senator Decay, you asked a question. The bill is, is very broad, but if you look down and I'm, it's too early in the morning to be able to read, but uh, sub, sub B, 4, 4 B says provide legal guidance uh, with and work with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Justice, uh, state and tribal law enforcement agencies like the Bureau of Interior and uh, Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So I think there's, uh, the idea would be that this person would work across the country, not even across the state, but uh, to try and keep track of where, where these folks have gone and, and what's going on. I'll, I uh, just want to support the bill and answer any questions I can. Are there any questions for this testifier? I do not see any. Thanks. Next proponent testifier. Welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Lestina Salmer Dassey, and I'm an enrolled member of the Sisitawan, Wakpetawan, Dakota Oyate of North and South Dakota, but I am also a lineal descendant of the Isanti tribe of Nebraska, who is actually a forced relocated tribe here to Nebraska from Minnesota. Um, I would like to speak in favor of LB 328 because um, Currently, I work in a position where I advocate for human and sex trafficking in the American Indian and Alaska Native populations. And there's so many cases of different intersectionalities and correlations with human trafficking and our murdered and miss missing indigenous people. And I just want to say that I also have four relatives, three who are active cold cases who are of the missing and murdered indigenous peoples population. And I also have a relative named Merle Saul who went missing out of Grand Island, Nebraska, and who is actively missing. But in my, in my perception, I feel like he was basically written off as a transient, um, written off because he suffered from alcohol related issues. And people did not take into consideration that he is a United States veteran and he risked his life in the, the uh, Vietnam War for this country. And it's very um, disappointing to me and the family that the police, the state patrol, um, whoever chooses to have jurisdiction cannot like actively form a search party like they did for Carrie Allen who was a recent case out of Omaha, Nebraska, who went missing. Um, so I really think that this office needs to be created and that there needs to be an indigenous person that um, is in charge of this office because we do have a different worldview from your typical Western or Caucasian person. And I feel like it takes somebody who has um, been in this been in these shoes or, or has the similar life experiences to understand some of the struggles that we go through as indigenous people. So I am highly in favor of this bill. And if you don't have any statistics on these rates, the Urban Indian Health Institute out of California is indigenous research by indigenous people. And that brings to light the data issue that oftentimes state, local, tribal, and federal do not work together to collaborate on data. So I think that this office should um, take that into consideration also when they staff the person. Thank you very much. Could you spell your name for the record for us, please? L-E-S as in Sam, T-I-N-A, last name Saul, S-A-U-L dash M-E-R-D-A-S-S-I. Thank you. Are there any questions for this testifier? I don't see any, but thank you so much for being here. Next proponent testifier. Good morning. My name is Rose Godinez, spelled R-O-S-E-G-O-D-I-N-E-Z, -E -E and I'm here to testify on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska in favor of LB 328. 
First, we'd like to thank Senator Raybould for introducing this legislation. The ACLU is committed to defending the rights of indigenous people and tribes to be free from discrimination and governmental abuse of power. LB 328 creates a much needed office at the AG's office to support a liaison between local, state, and tribal and federal entities on the specific issue of missing and murdered indigenous persons cases in Nebraska. For context, Nebraska ranks seventh among states with the highest number of murdered and missing indigenous women. In addition to the more updated statistics that Senator Raybould uh, mentioned in her opening, I just want to highlight the report from the Urban Indian Health Institute, which was just mentioned by the previous testifier, um, that served as a siren on on this issue, particularly in Nebraska. The report, if you want to look it up, is called Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, a snapshot of data from 71 urban cities in the United States. The report detailed an astonishing lack of data on the issue. For example, the report stated the National Crime Information Center reported that in 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls. Through the U.S. Department of Justice's Federal Missing Persons Database, NAMIS only logged 116 cases. Of the 71 cities for which data was requested and collected, Omaha, Nebraska ranked eight among cities and Nebraska ranked seven among states with the highest number of murdered and indigenous women, missing women, indigenous women and girls. A liaison between all key stakeholders as set out in LB 328 is an important step to address this ongoing crisis. In this instance, the historical issues regarding jurisdiction, the misunderstanding of race, ethnicity, and political affiliation, the uh, inconsistencies in databases and gender have led to a persistent and widespread lack of appropriate responses. And then I would be remiss to not mention that this is particularly more important now than ever with the recent Supreme Court decision of Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta, which um, ruled that it expanded state's authority to prosecute non-natives who commit crimes against native persons on tribal nations. As such, we offer our full support of LB 328 and urge the committee to advance this bill to general file. All right, are there any questions for this testifier? I don't see any, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's have our next proponent testifier. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Judy Goshkabash. That is spelled J U D I G A I A S H K I B O S. And I am the Executive Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. And I want to thank you all. And especially, I would like to thank Senator Jane Raybould for uh, being willing to introduce this important legislation and she did such a fabulous job in her opening I don't really feel like I have too much to add I also want to thank all of the uh, tribal people that came so far this early this morning that's a real challenge with hearings being in the morning so I was a little worried but they came forward and they stood strong with me to support this important legislation for our uh, native women I um, also want to thank the other people that testified as well and uh, former Senator Don Wesley uh, said he was gonna go back in time. And I know Senator Raybould said that as well. And I wanted to go back just a bit to the timeline here, uh, thanking the senators that introduced the LB 154, Senator De DeBoyer was one of those, uh, Senator Brewer, Senator Patty Pansing-Brooks. And uh, <coughs> that was a result it, that came out of, in 2017, the closing of White Clay. And we had a task force then, and one of my uh, wishes that I uh, begged uh, Senator Brewer and Patty Pansing Brooks was to uh, do something about missing and murdered indigenous women. And so that resulted in LB 154, the study. So you all have the uh, study report and that was a partnership with the uh, State Patrol and the Indian Commission. We went out and we did listening sessions on all of the reservations and the data reflects 
uh, some of the findings that were cited in the opening by Senator Raybould of what we should do going forward. I'd like to tell you a story and personalize, and I see the lights already on, and I'm going to go really fast. I want you to go out of this hearing remembering I dedicate my uh, testimony to those lives of missing and murdered women already lost. Cozy Decora was only 22 years old and a mother to three and a member of the Ho-Chunk tribe, murdered May 16, 2020 by her fiance near Winnebago, Nebraska. Ashley Aldrich was age 29 and a member of the Omaha tribe and mother to two children. Her body was found January 7, 2020 in a field near Macy, Nebraska. Ashley Wabashaw, <coughs> age 19, a member of the Santee Sioux Nation, was last seen on March 27th, and we have not been able to find her yet. Uh, Esther Wolf, age 21, she was missing for eight days in July 2019. She was kidnapped by her ex-boyfriend in Rapid City, South Dakota. She was transported across the border into Nebraska and repeatedly assaulted and held captive at a Nebraska motel in Chadron. Oh. The assailants were charged with kidnapping and assault. I'm afraid, Recently, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you there. Okay, so uh, in closing, um, I think this bill is really uh, important because it creates that liaison person who would do a variety of things, and um, they wouldn't be so much an investigator. I know that was a question that was answered. We would prefer, hopefully, that the person is Native American and has that cultural sensitivity and or has had experience working with Native people. They would cover the whole state. They would be within the AG's office. One of the questions asked was, what are other states doing? Some states, as in South Dakota, they have um, someone that does human trafficking in the AG's office, a Native person. They also have a missing and murdered Indigenous person uh, liaison. We don't really have statistical data yet because these are all pretty new, but Minnesota, uh, Arizona, Wyoming, Montana, Washington State, and hopefully now Nebraska. Okay. So thank, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Any questions? Are there any questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you. Next proponent testifier. Any other who would like to testify in favor of this bill? Are there any opponents? Anyone who wishes to testify in opposition to this bill? Is there anyone here today who would like to testify in the neutral capacity? Chair Gore, thank you, uh, members of the committee. My name is Glenn Parks, G-L-E-N-P-A-R-K-S. I am uh, Assistant Attorney General and the coordinator of the Nebraska Human Trafficking Task Force. I'm here on behalf of the Attorney General Mike Hilgers uh, in a neutral capacity. We do endorse the, the objective of the bill, um, increased you know, information and cooperation among agencies. Um, since if the bill does pass, it will require the office to create an an office within the office and hire, hire these um, the liaison. We have a few logistical concerns uh, we want to raise here. Before I do list those, I do want to say that um, we're eager to work. If this does come out of committee, we're eager to work with uh, Senator Raybolt and, and the committee and proponents of this to address these four issues, uh, which are uh, the first one is that um, it, we're curious if this could be accomplished with a position, but not creating an office. Uh, the Attorney General's office doesn't have offices within the office. This may be a nomenclature thing, but that would be something we'd like to address. Um, secondly, on line 24 of the current version of the bill, the Attorney General is required to pursue any available federal funding. Um, with very few exceptions, the AG's office does not seek federal funding for its, its tasks. Uh, that is usually the Crime Commission's role. Um, this is obviously not essential to this bill as subsection five then of course gives the intent of the legislature to, to fund this and the, the fiscal note reflects that to fund the uh, position and travel expenses and all. So we'd ask, uh, uh, request that to be removed. Um, thirdly, uh, it requires us to 
um, appoint, uh, hire a specialist. And we're just not sure what that exactly requires. Is that some additional uh, qualifications? Of course, there is the, uh, the preference for um, applicants of indigenous descent, which makes sense. But if there's anything else, another requirement that we should uh, demand of, of candidates that are eligible, we'd like that to be made clear. If not, we prefer the word specialist to just say liaison or something. So in five and 10 years from now, when the AG's office is trying to fulfill the law, it's very clear if there is additional requirements for this position or not. And finally, the last uh, uh, there, it requires the Attorney General to, quote, provide legal guidance, uh, end quote, and coordinate the functions of several offices, including federal and tribal. Um, and we're not certain what that means. Uh, legal guidance um, is, is a term of art, obviously, in the AG's office. So if that could be clarified at some point. Uh, before I close, though, I want to speak as the coordinator of a task force. Uh, if this bill passes, we would ask this, this uh, liaison to um, gather information from, collate, synthesize, and give information from and to local, state, federal, and tribal authorities. Um, as you know, this is not, may I speak a little bit longer? Uh, please finish up quickly. Okay. Um, the, there's no demand for federal and tribal authorities uh, to work, to uh, give this information. I run a uh, statewide task force and I have experience with agencies who don't want to work with us or don't want to share this information. So I guess I just want to lower our expectations if we do this. This is a step in the right direction. Uh, we do think this is a good idea, but it is a small step in the right direction. And if this is in our office, I don't want to have unrealistic expectations that this is the silver bullet. Again, I want to okay. reiterate we're willing to talk um, further at this process. Okay. Any questions? Are there any questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you okay. so much for being here. Thank you. Other neutral testimony. Anyone else here to testify in the neutral capacity? All right, Senator Rabel to close. And as she's coming forward, I'll tell you that we have, for the record, we have received 14 letters in support. Senator Rabel. Thank you very much. I want to remind everyone, Nebraska is home to four federally recognized tribes. Omaha Tribe of Nebraska, Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, Santi Sioux Nation, and Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. Other Nebraska resident tribes include the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma, Ogallala Sioux Tribe, Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Tribes. There are many native persons living on and off tribal lands. This liaison in the office of the attorney general will go a long way in helping bridge the disparity that we see in data collection that helps solve missing and indigenous people's cases. And I just wanna uh, address some of the comments from Mr. Parks, because I know the report gave a tremendous amount of recommendation and action items that would specifically apply to this individual that I'm happy to, to share with Mr. Parks afterward. And there is no doubt his work is so profoundly important and there is that interconnectedness between human trafficking and missing individuals. We know that working with the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the FBI, Department of Justice, and all this efforts to collect appropriate data that gives us the indications of where we need to go and the problems that we need to solve are critical. Having this liaison person to do some of that work, the data collection, analyzing it, but they also need to have that authority working with the Attorney General's office to transcend and work with State Patrol, work with FBI, the Department of Justice, to make sure that we are on the right pathway to assisting and solving this problem. And just a you know, I'm happy to give you the report. I don't want to take up any more time, but there are several action items recognized in the report that would fall under the scope of the specialist or the liaison officer in trying to come up with solutions to this problem. And I wanted to respond to Senator Decay. In addition to us sending you out the full report, we will follow up with all those states that have implemented this type of position and give you more data to help you make a great decision. But in closing, I do ask for my colleagues' support on this. 
I think we owe it to the, the tribal members in our community and in our state. I do want to thank Judy and her efforts on behalf of so many. And I do want to thank the tribal members who did travel so far to provide their testimony for you all today. So thank you very much. And if there's any other questions I can try to answer, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much, Senator Raybould. Are there questions from the committee? I don't see any. Thank you so much. Thank so with that, we'll close the hearing on LB 328 and open the hearing on LB 135. So welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Senator John Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chairperson DeBoer and members of the Judiciary Committee. I actually have some testimony handouts uh, that if I can get the pages, maybe I'll wait. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer and members of the Judiciary Committee. The testimony I'm having circulated is testimony from uh, the Innocence Project who wanted to be here to testify, but due to weather constraints, I think they got stuck in Kentucky is where I heard they were. So this is the testimony of the Innocence Project who wanted to be here, but couldn't. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure you had that in your hands. Uh, my name is John Cavanaugh, J-O-H-N-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H, and I represent the 9th Legislative District in Midtown Omaha. I'm here today to introduce LB 135, which prohibits the use of deception by police officers in question, questioning of juveniles. Police lie. That sounds like a shocking and controversial statement, but in the case of interrogations, it is an indisputable truth. Deceptions and outright falsehoods are commonly used interrogation technique by law enforcement to elicit confessions from potential suspects. Police are allowed to, and very often do, lie about evidence linking a person to a crime even if no such evidence exists. This includes conveying a false offer of leniency, such as, you'll be free to go if you just tell us what happened. These sorts of tactics can often lead to false or coerced confessions, particularly in, when it comes to juveniles. When I introduced this bill last year as LB 732, a representative of the Omaha Police Union testified against the bill, saying that it, it was a necessary tool for police to be able to lie and deceive. Another representative of the Omaha Police Department described the deceptive practice used by the department regularly, which would be disallowed under this bill. I expect that you'll hear similar testimony today. There is no dispute that these practices take place. The only question is whether they're acceptable. Children are particularly susceptible to, the, to suggestion and false information, which could lead to false confessions. LB 135 states, that a statement obtained as a result of deception shall not be admissible against a juvenile who made that statement. The primary difference between LB 135 and LB 732 is the addition of the, of the word false in subsection 3A2. This addresses the concerns raised by the Nebraska Bar Association regarding the language around offers of leniency. In LB 135, communicating false facts, false information, or false statements regarding leniency would be inadmissible in addition to communicating false facts about the evidence in the case. This makes sure that the ordinary plea bargaining process is not disrupted by the bill in any way, and that it only targets the use of deception by police officers during an interrogation. Fundamentally, the question comes down to this. Is it okay for cops to lie to kids? I am a firm, firmly believer of the belief that no, it is not okay. You'll hear testimony today from veteran police officers who say they will not be able to do their job effectively if they cannot lie to kids. And I hope that officers, their police departments, and their union leadership will take the time to reflect on how that position and that attitude serves to erode the trust between law enforcement and the community, and that these they're supposed to protect and serve. I've distributed the testimony and letters from Innocence Project and Wicklander Zolkowski, a law enforcement training consultant that focuses on ethical, truthful interrogation techniques. I thank you for your time, and I'd ask you to support 135 forward, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Uh, Senator Holcroft. Thank you, Chairman DeBoer. Um, hasn't the Supreme Court ruled on something similar to this? Uh, well, it's, 
in any capacity they've ruled that it's acceptable under the Constitution. So the Supreme Court said it's okay to use deception in, uh, during interrogation. Yes, and that's why I'm bringing a law to say that we shouldn't do it. Okay. Any other questions for Senator Kavanaugh? I don't see any. You want to stay around for closing? Yep. All right, let's have our first <coughs> proponent testifier, please. First proponent. Good morning. Um, thank you, Senator uh, DeBoer and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Anaïs Salazar, A-N-A-H-I-S-A-L-A-Z-A-R, and I represent Voices for Children in Nebraska, here today in support of LB-135. Our justice system should ensure that youth are held accountable for their actions in develop developmentally appropriate ways, through mechani mechanisms that are fair and unbiased. We are here to support LB-135 because it would prohibit investigators from knowingly communicating false facts about evidence and unauthorized statements regarding leniency with interrogating youth in custody, tactics which can lead to false confessions instead of reliable ones and result in tragic miscarriages of justice. To put it plainly, current law allows police to lie to children in order to coerce confessions to crimes they may or may not have committed. Research has repeatedly shown that young people are particularly susceptible to manipulation during interrogation due to a prefrontal cortex still in development. Adolescents can have weak judgment, problem-solving skills, and decision-making abilities as compared to adults. Deceptive tactics by investigators can, as a result, be especially coercive to young people, particularly in the stressful <coughs> setting of an interrogation. False confessions have played a role in approximately 30% of all wrong convictions later overturned by DNA, DNA evidence. Data from the Innocence Projects across the country show that in 340 exoneration cases, 42% of individuals who were a minor at the time of interrogation had falsely confessed, compared with only 13% of adults. In one study, minors from 12 to 16 years of age showed a significant impact in police compliance with the addition of false evidence in, in interrogations, highlighting how younger individuals are more susceptible to compliance and agreement with information given in investigations without, without regard to whether the information is true or false. Youth are not sophisticated criminal actors and lying to children about facts, rights, and possible consequence, consequences should be beneath the dignity and integrity of our justice system. It cuts at the very heart of what justice means and we should expect our law enforcement agencies to do better. It is time for Nebraska to demonstrate its commitment to a fair and equitable justice system and to end this harmful practice. We thank Senator John Kavanaugh for his work on this critical issue and thank the committee for your time and consideration. We respectfully urge to advance LB 135 and I'm available to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for this testifier? I do not see any. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Next. Proponent testifier. Welcome to your Judiciary Committee. My name is Jennifer Craven, J E N N I F E R C R A V E N. I am a second year law student at UNL. Before law school, I worked with kids for over 10, for 10 years as a teacher, including seven years teaching middle school in Omaha public schools. Last fall, I wrote a research paper for the Nebraska Law Review. In my paper, I argued for the adoption of a bill like LB 135. I've provided a handout with some key findings from my paper, which is forthcoming in volume 1021 of the Nebraska Law Review. The handout includes a link where you can read my latest draft if you would like more information. Many police departments, including those in Nebraska, condone the use of deception to interrogate suspects. The goal of the deception is to convince the suspect to confess. Common tactics include claiming to have physical evidence when no such evidence actually exists, claiming that there is enough evidence to convict the suspect without a confession, without a confession and implying that the prosecution might be more lenient if the suspect confesses. It's easy to assume that this deception would only work if the suspect was actually guilty, but unfortunately there are cases that prove otherwise. There are many examples where these deceptive interrogation tactics led to false confessions and wrongful convictions. Juveniles are especially vulnerable because their brains are not fully developed. They're more impulsive and more easily influenced by authority figures. 
They have trouble understanding the long-term confession uh, consequences of a confession, and may believe that if they say the right thing, they will get to go home. Even older teens struggle with these issues. Of the known cases of exonerated juveniles, um, the data that I found said about 35% involved a false confession. While I believe deceptive tactics should be banned for all suspects, LB-135 is an important first step to protecting the most vulnerable. At the hearing on last year's version of this bill, several officers acknowledged that police in Nebraska use these deceptive interrogation techniques. They said that the purpose is to get to the truth. Proponents of this method say that officers only use these tactics when they believe they have the right suspect, but sometimes they're wrong. We all want justice, but wrongful convictions are not justice. Lying is not a good way to find the truth. I urge you to prioritize LB-135 to, project, to protect juveniles from this risk, either alone or as part of a juvenile justice package with other bills that have been introduced this session. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Uh, we'll start with Senator Ibach. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you for being here today. Can you just clarify for me, um, under your National Registry of Exonerations? Yes. Are those an annual or a... Um, uh, so the latest statistics that I have, and I just checked this again yesterday, um, was from April 2022. So I'm guessing there'll be some more data put out maybe this next April, but that's the most recent data. Would those be like an annual accounting, though? Um, I mean, are there 268 known exonerations from wrongfully convicted juveniles annually, or is that... I believe it's since... I believe they started collecting data in 1989. Okay, so that's... An accumulation of data. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ibach. Senator Geist. Um, yes, thank you for your testimony. How many states have adopted this sort of thing? Do you know? Great question. So I know that it's been adopted in Illinois um, and Oregon. I believe that New York adopted something similar. Um, those are the states that I remember right now off the top of my head, but um, like I said, my there's a link to my paper there if you want to take a look at that, and I'll, I'll be updating. Would that be, well. list, is that information in your paper? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know I mentioned the bills in those states. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Geist. Other questions for this testifier? You don't see me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Let's have the next proponent testifier. Good morning, Senator DeBoer, members of the committee. I'm Joe Nigro. I'm here in support of LB-135 as a private citizen. I was a public defender for 39 years and I'm now retired. I wanna thank Senator Kavanaugh for introducing this bill. LB-135 is simple. It says police cannot lie to children. I don't think the police should lie to anyone, but it's especially egregious when they lie to children. A juvenile judge once told me that if a police officer lies to a child, it makes it difficult for the child to trust anyone in the system, including judges and probation officers, causing all sorts of problems. Two years ago, Illinois passed similar legislation. Oregon quickly followed. Other states have considered doing the same thing. Opponents of this bill may tell you that lying to children is an important law enforcement technique to which I say poppycock. It may be a technique that gets someone to confess, but it doesn't get someone to tell you the truth. The goal for police when they conduct an investigation should always be to learn the truth. It's wrong to have a system where it's a crime to lie to police, but police can lie to you. Would any sane person say parents lying to children to get them to confess to something is a good parenting technique? If it's a bad idea for parents to do something, it's a bad idea for the police to do it. And I urge the committee to advance this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Nigro? Do not see me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. Uh, 
Hi, good morning. My name is Spike Eichholt, S-P-I-K-E. Last name is E-I-C-K-H-O-L-T. I'm appearing on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska and the Nebraska Criminal Offense Attorneys Association in support of LD-135. We want to thank Senator John Kavanaugh for introducing the bill. I'm having uh, passed out just a one-page summary of the law, if you will, in Nebraska when it comes to police deception. And then I give a couple of examples or several examples of some cases from our state Supreme Court where they have permitted law enforcement to use uh, deception during questioning. Um, you heard people say, and it's simply a fact, and I suspect the opponents, if they do testify live, are going to explain and acknowledge that they do use deceptive tactics when <laughs> questioning individuals. They can misrepresent facts when questioning an individual about a possible crime. They can also, to a certain extent, misrepresent the status of the law, the possible penalties, promises of leniency, and that sort of thing. And the test, basically, the Supreme Court has acknowledged or has crafted is that Mere police deception does not render an omission or confession from being used against a, person, a defendant. The test for determining the admissibility of the statement is whether that deception produced false or untrustworthy confessions or statements. So we kind of have this sort of ends justify the means standard. This bill, it makes what I would suggest, is a modest reform to that. And it simply says law enforcement should not use this deceptive tool against people under 18, against children. It is a crime for any person to lie to the police. It's a class one misdemeanor to provide false reporting. It's a felony if you provide false information as to your identity. But law enforcement is permitted to use it against people who are presumed innocent, people who are questioned oftentimes without their parents being notified, without their lawyers being notified if they have an attorney. And the law presumes that people sort of know what their rights are and that law enforcement is permitted to somehow do these different tactics when questioning to elicit incriminating responses. I would submit, and I think the data is clear, that juveniles don't know what their rights are. They aren't quite aware of what situation is going when they're being questioned by an officer. And what this bill simply says, it doesn't say that you can't question you. It doesn't even require that parents be notified. It doesn't require that a lawyer be provided. It simply says that law enforcement shall not use deception against those children when being questioned. So we would urge the committee to support the bill and I'll answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions for this testifier? Senator Holcroft. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. So if the uh, police officer walks in and says, son, you're in trouble now, would that be considered deception? No, because that's probably accurate. There's an officer question and they probably are in some sort of trouble. Well, they, you know, so, so there's sometimes when he might say something that may not be correct, but it's uh, acceptable. Um, I don't. Know if you're in trouble now, is actually a misrepresentation of facts. Um, but I think I see what what you're asking. That, for instance, law enforcement officer may not be aware of perhaps the, this true circumstance, and they may inadvertently misrepresent something during questioning. I think the bill captures that because it does provide for intentionally and knowingly an officer is prohibited from detention, intentionally and knowingly using deceptive practices when questioning. Well, there's what, four lines here that describe what is deception in the bill. I think we'll, well, I'll wait to hear what the, the officers have to say, but I'm, I'm not sure that's enough guidance really to, uh, to enact a uh, pretty broad, uh, pretty broad law in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I do have one. How would this bill interact with undercover agents um, or not interact with undercover agents? So if I'm an undercover agent um, and I'm talking to a youth, um, a young person, and I'm deceiving them as to the fact that I am an undercover agent uh, by virtue of interacting with them, would that be, uh, would that trigger this bill? That's a good question. I don't know if an officer acting in their undercover capacity when talking with or conversing or maybe even questioning <coughs> somebody, but that, if that would even be considered an interrogation. Um, the language of the bill sort of implies interviewing, questioning, or interrogating, and that would imply an acknowledgement at some point in the interrogation that that person is a law enforcement officer and that they are questioning them. That's kind of the standard or some of the cases decide, define what interrogation means. Um, I mean, an officer in their undercover capacity, right, is already sort of, <laughs> ipso facto, has already right. deceived anyone anyway, right? Because they're there sort of pretending to be any someone other than an officer. 
Um, but that's probably a fair point. And I don't, I can't speak for Senator John Kavanaugh, but I think what his intent is to provide for formal questioning, formal interviewing, formal interrogation of law enforcement officer of a juvenile. Okay. Because there you have that power imbalance, you have that defer deference to authority, and you have that um, time, that forum, when anything that person says is going to be used against them. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Next proponent testifier. Next person who would like to uh, testify in favor of the bill. Francis Kuhlman, Lincoln, Nebraska, K-U-H-L-M-A-N. Um, I don't think deception should ever be used by uh, a law enforcement officer and investigator, especially against, you know, juveniles. As far as, uh, son, you're in trouble now. Um, he might be in trouble, but he might not be in trouble. That you're innocent until proven guilty in America, in, in my opinion, he's already deceiving and scaring that kid. So he should be prohibited from saying that. Undercover agents, uh, there again, we're, here we go into the deception area, uh, a sting operation, let's say. Some kid, uh, th there's drugs being sold in our high school, and so we have, to, uh, we have to do a sting operation to find out which kids are selling them. So now we have, what? adults showing up at the border of the school or maybe you convince a kid to to lie you know and, and try to snitch and find out information whatever but let's just say it's an adult a cop showing up at the border of the school um trying to buy drugs so the kid well um are, are you a cop how do i know i'm not going to get in trouble by selling you a little bit of marijuana and what does the sting operation what does the undercover cop say he lies. He deceives them. No, I'm not a cop. I'm just, uh, you know, somebody that needs a high, needs to be able to relax, needs to be able to tr treat my arthritis with a little bit of pot. That shouldn't happen either, in my opinion. They should be required to stick to the truth. So anyway, I'm a proponent of this bill, um, open for questions. Any questions for this testifier? Do not see any today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. Anyone else who would like to testify in favor of the bill? You can fill that out after if you want. But I will. Hi, my name is Nature Viegas, N A T U R E V I L L E G A S. I wasn't going to testify on this, but listening to everyone talk, um, I went through acculturation at age nine where they took us out of our homes and they put us in the system. They cut our hair, they took our clothes, they took our culture, they took our languages. Um, I could go on and on, but as you all know, I don't have a lot of time. So hearing the questions, um, when I got thrown into the system, I was automatically labeled. I face things no child should have to face by adults, by police, by people in positions that should have had the audacity to stand up and be my voice, especially when I came to them and say, harms and crimes were happening inside group homes, foster homes, um, psych wards, juvenile detention centers. I can go on and on, but again, I have limited time. And deceit was used by officers and others in these high up positions to intimidate me, to scare me. And as you can tell, I'm a little bit on the feisty side, so it didn't really work. And that really pissed them off. So I became even more criminalized. As a child that turned to officers that turned to judges, that turned to caseworkers, that turned, I didn't know about this yet, or I would have been here there too, 
Um, and instead I got locked away, I got beaten, I got tossed around in the system. I literally grew in the system by the state of, no, state of Nebraska did this. This is why I will not leave state of Nebraska. I'm not even from here. I'm here to make changes because Nebraska fucked my life up and I don't know how else to say that. I just happen to be the queen of turning pain to power, but not everybody knows how to do that or find that, or maybe it's too late for them. I don't know. They don't make it. Not all of us make it. I'm uphill every day in my life now, still picking up all these pieces. So no, it is not okay to use deception to intimidate children. It's not okay. And the fact that we're even debating that is disgusting. And it must be nice to be so comfortable that you really don't have to worry about it, or maybe your kids don't. But never should we use deceit with humans, let alone children. It's horrible, and I trust no officials sitting before you at 42 because of that. That is a huge part of that. Nebraska is very terrible at not being accountable some, for things they do to people. And apparently adults, we don't like to see adults as humans. Fine. Can we at least see our children as humans? Because we do grow up. And I graduated from foster care and group homes all the way up to prison. And half of the t all of my juvenile time, I did no crime. Do you hear me? I did no crimes. I was thrown away with deceit. That's what they use deceit for, to throw us away. That's all I have. Are there any questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you so much for being here. Next proponent testifier. Anyone else in favor of the bill? Okay, now let's take our first opponent testifier. Anyone here who would like to speak in opposition to this bill? Chairman DeVore, thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Barral. It is M-A-T-T-B-A-R-R-A-L-L. -L. I am here speaking as the Vice President for the State Fraternal Order of Police in opposition to this bill. This is a very delicate subject. The use of deception, I would agree, as a 24-year law enforcement veteran, is something that needs to be used very delicately and should be used very sparingly. However, in my time in law enforcement, I have encountered juvenile murderers, juvenile rapists, juvenile sex offenders, and in those cases, juvenile armed robbers. In those cases, many times, we don't need to use deception. In fact, I would argue to the contrary of what has been previously stated, that we use it many times. In my experience, we use it sparingly. However, there are times, like anything else, that it can become necessary. Many agencies have policies in place and best practices that say an adult needs to be present. My own law enforcement agency has that. If we are conducting an interview or an interrogation where there is custody, meaning they are not free to leave, we have to read them the rights per Miranda, whether it's a juvenile or an adult. In those cases, if they do not understand, it is on us to stop that interview. We need to be able to make good decisions as law enforcement officers but part of that is also being able to keep the tools at our disposal. If there's any questions, I'm free to answer. Any questions? Senator McKinney. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your testimony. So you're opposing this saying that it's a good decision to lie to kids or deceive them. I am opposing this saying that it is a tool that is sometimes necessary. Is it good? I couldn't say if it's good. Sometimes it's necessary. 
but you don't consider the negative impacts of util utilizing deceptive tactics upon kids. There can absolutely be negative impacts. That is why it is and so- shouldn't that outweigh your, your ability to try to use a tool to deceive them? I do not believe so. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Holcroft. Thank you, Chairman, Vice Chairman DeBoer. Thank you for your testimony. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on what the law says or what your requirements are to contact a guardian or parent before you start interrogation? So there isn't actually a law that says we have to. Um, it is definitely the best practice, and I would say that most law enforcement agencies that I have dealt with, which is limited to Eastern Nebraska, they have those policies in place. My agency has that in place. The Omaha Police Department has that in place. Many of the other agencies in Sarpa County have that in place. We do not conduct an interview if there is not an adult present. We will forego that. If I get someone on the phone that says, yes, you can interview my child, we will do that, but we will not do it without at least speaking to a parent or guardian first. And that's a policy. It's a policy. It is not law. I can't say that I would be against a law that says a parent or guardian has to be present. I think that would probably be a very good law. But being able to limit the tools that we have is, I don't believe, is a good law. Thank you. Other questions? Senator McKinney. Thank you. So do you notify the parents that you collided your kids to? Do I notify? If a parent is present, do you notify them that during this inter interrogation, I can get away with lying to your kid? No, I do not. Thank you. Other questions? I'll, I'll ask you one. You've suggested that there are situations in which it's necessary to lie. Um, can you give me an example of what I'm trying to wrap my head around what that looks like? Okay. Um, so I have used deception in a sexual assault case involving a 17 year old, which would qualify under this law, um, in which I have said that we have DNA evidence that would lead to your arrest and said, do you think that that DNA, will your, your DNA evidence be there that we have collected? And I didn't know if we had collected it. And that gave the confession that yes, we actually did engage in sexual intercourse and it was against her will. So yes, I have done that. There's, there is one example that I can say that I personally have used. You didn't know whether or not the DNA had been collected. Correct. So, I mean, that's maybe not but that would qualify under this law. That, yeah. that, so I, I try and resist to say what my personal practices are because I don't, this isn't just talking about me, I'm representing yeah. the law enforcement for the state of Nebraska. Uh, you know, I personally find that using the truth can get you much more than lying to someone. However, there are those times in which it's unnecessary. Senator Blood. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. And thank you for coming today. I know you don't have an easy job, and I know you're in a hot seat right now. I appreciate you staying calm and answering questions. But I, I do have a hard question, and unfortunately, I had to miss Senator Kavanaugh's introduction, so perhaps it was covered in this introduction. But when you interrogate, do you take into consideration um, developmental considerations um, in adolescence, because we know that lost times when that's not taken into consideration, that's when we get the false confessions. So what kind of considerations do you have when it comes to them developmentally? Is it that they're like 10 to 12, you have a certain type of way you interrogate, 12 to 17, like do you, do you take into consideration, because we know, especially young men, no offense, their brains don't develop as awesomely as women. Um, <laughs> You're not wrong. And that's science. I, <laughs> I get to say that with a smile. That's science. Um, so that, that's one of the concerns that I have is that we know science shows us 
that developmentally, um, and tests after tests, we've done a lot of research, something like up to 44% of these test groups, the kids give false confessions, <clears throat> and it's because we don't take that into consideration. So the question for clarification, because I've wandered off, is is developmental consideration taken into account that that, that can create a false confession when you guys talk to them? We do at the Serpa County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Absolutely. Can you tell me, walk me through how, like, well, categorize it for me? Again, we try and have a parent present. Okay. But not we, all parents are available, right? Or necessarily even, you know, we won't, we won't conduct an interview without some sort of parental or guardian authorization. Ever? Ever. Okay. We do not do that. That is against our policy. When I speak to a juvenile, I would be extremely hesitant to even interview a child under 12. Um, that goes against all of my law enforcement training and actually being able to have the mental capacity to commit a crime and know that they've committed a crime. Okay. So there's that step. Further, there's a step on whether they really understand their rights under Miranda. So I can read them Miranda, which is a very adult thing. Right. And if it is my belief that they don't understand, I won't interview them. How, how do you, and, and I'm like, I'm really trying to get my head wrapped around this. How do you know? Like I can, I, I, I can tell you that I sit in rooms of senators. Well, I'll explain to them like blockchain technology and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. And then you get to the fourth road vote and you're like, yeah, I don't understand it. So a child can say, I understand my rights. How do, how do you know I ask, I ask them to explain it back to me. Okay. And if they can't explain it, that they have the right not to say anything to me, that I can't force them to talk, then I won't do it. Okay. That's what I do. And that's what I've been trained to do. And it's uh, the Wicklander Zawowski reference that mm -hmm. was made. Um, by uh, I cold that's that's within that training um, and it is it's it's an excellent training um, so I don't know is it universal no um, should it be Absolutely. certainly um, that that would be a, a very important thing to have you know if we want to talk about training in law enforcement and extensions for that specific type of thing I think that's an excellent idea so that would be something you would support absolutely I really appreciate you helping me break this down. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Decay. Thank you, Senator DeBoer. Quick question. Um, you cited an example of a case that you used. I was going to ask, is there ever cases where there's a sense of urgency where you might have to use the deception um, way of doing it as opposed to like waiting till a, a DNA sample does come back from hospital doctor or whoever? It's an interesting question. I'm trying to come up with a specific example. I could see there possibly being the case if we had a homicide with a weapon at large um, and trying to locate that um, so it wasn't placed in the hands of someone else that could injure themselves with it. In regards to my specific example that I used, um, we had the 17 year old at the time. Um, we knew that an act had occurred. Um, could I have waited for proof? Possibly, but I had that interview there and I had that person's guardian there with me. Um, so in that specific instance, it played into the entire interview. Um, and again, the, there have been instances within the state of Nebraska where juveniles were blatantly lied to and coerced. Um, I think the, the Beatrice uh, case is probably a prime example. And I watched that interview and I was appalled by it. That goes so far beyond the training um, that we receive in modern law enforcement. Um, so there would be something that I would say that there is an egregious example. It does, it, it has happened. Um, 
but the only thing that you can really do is to provide the best possible training and example similar to what senator blood just just asked on when is it necessary and i would say that there, there are just there are times that it can be necessary and i would hate to see that tool get taken away thank you for your explanation thank you senator k senator mckinney Thank you, Senator Gore. Um, would you be open to having to not tell the parents that you've lied to her kids? Hmm. I wouldn't be against it. You would be against I it? I would not be against it. You wouldn't? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Other, Senator Ibaugh. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony as well. I just keep going back to the whole um, interpretation question with all of the testifiers. And is there some confusion or um, maybe a reason why you would phrase or word things differently to try to get juveniles to admit something or I mean is there something in your training that says if you ask it this way and this kind of goes back to Senator Blood's question too as far as if juveniles brains don't develop at the same rate or they're behind is there an interpretation question as far as this is the way we ask it this is the way juveniles typically hear it is there that goes outside my realm of knowledge so. that would be a psychologist that needs yeah, to i'm okay. sorry i would love to be able to answer that question i don't know the answer to that okay thank you thank you senator Iba. other questions from the committee thank you so much for being here next opponent testifier I'm William Brin. William is spelled W-I-L-L-I-A-M-R-I-N-N. -I I'm the Chief Deputy of Administration for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Sheriff Hanson wishes he could be here today, but he asked me to come in his stead and speak on our behalf. I'll try and be brief uh, and read this and, and open up for questions if there's time. Uh, we are fervent in our ongoing mission to find that equilibrium between the protection of youth in Omaha and the overall safety of the public. At the forefront of discussion are the increases in juvenile-involved crimes of violence and weapons violations by juvenile offenders, both nationally and locally. Um, moreover, there does lie a deeper concern of the recruitment of younger offenders that are uh, committing crimes that are traditionally committed by adults, uh, knowing that there's potentially leniency offered to juveniles who are involved in such crimes. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in Fraser v. Cup allowed the use of deception for law enforcement officers so long as it follows the standard of does not shock the conscience. Uh, we would be ignorant if reckless. We do not recognize the credible literature and research that confirms the vulnerability of uh, use when tendency to be uh, uh, using deception. And they would produce false confessions. However, the midline of such themes in those literatures does stop short of the outright ban of the practice. Rather, such summations and findings indicate the need for a balanced approach, which includes, but is not limited to training education, and the thorough value of situations and the reliance of the protections of due process. In such cases, the Reasonable Child Standard Act is used, and in totality circumstances should be weighed in which age is just but one factor. There is sufficient state safeguards in place, and has been proven in states in Iowa court in which intrinsic lies have been used and suppressed. Uh, limitations on false facts uh, do create a public safety issue. There's a foundational counterweight found in the Fifth Amendment uh, with regards to weighing and voluntariness and the use of state mandated recording of juvenile interviews, which can later be used to determine if proper procedures were unnecessarily unlawfully used. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Are there any questions for this testifier, Senator McKinney? Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Just for the record, are you saying that the Douglas County Sheriff's Office thinks it's good to lie or deceive juveniles? I'm going to say that it is not good, but I would say that still is necessary to be used very stringently. I would uh, hold our uh, accreditation in front of it, which goes beyond policy, uh, to make sure that we have extremely stringent uh, juvenile programs and juvenile interrogation programs to make sure that it, uh, if it has to be used, that it's done in a manner that can be regulated and uh, the least harmful. Done in a manner that could be regulated against, according to the population of the uh, DCYC in, in Omaha, 80 plus percent black kids and probably 90 plus percent of minority kids that you think it's okay to deceive. Thank you. Uh, Senator Geis, um, briefly, did you say that you record, you video all of the interviews that are are done with between an officer and a juvenile? If they are a formal interrogation or interview, yes, we do. Uh, we do it also in the field as well with body cams and or the cruiser cameras. Are any of those recordings used for training or um, are they looked on later uh, if there's question about whether that was done properly? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grice. Senator Blood. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. Thank you for coming in today, Chief Deputy. Um, I have a question for you. Um, based on the letter that you gave us today, you said one of the deeper concerns were, quote, of the recruitment of youth offenders to commit traditionally adult-based crimes involving weapons, handguns, and violence due to the tendency towards leniency for juveniles. So that's been going on forever. So I'm kind of curious, I know what's being done in Sarpa County, what's being done in Douglas County to help prevent this? I mean, you're using it as a reason that, is, that you would like the ability to, to be untruthful with juvenile offenders. What are we doing to prevent them from coming into the system right now, as well, far as Douglas County goes? Well, I think our, our concern is, is the uh, broadness of this bill as it states and that uh, we would, uh, the, the gun violence and the vi crime violence, I think uh, our gentleman from Sarpa County has testified to is of concern to us. What's being done is I know that the Sheriff's Office is heavily involved, the Sheriff specifically with uh, youth and youth diversion programs and trying to figure out where these youth can be placed other than the youth center <laughs> and follow-up programs to help track them out on the street uh, in a way that's less intrusive than being incarcerated. Would you say you've got good data that shows that that's actually, that you're making inroads in that? Because I, I've not really seen anything on that from Douglas County, so I'm kind of curious like where you're at on that. Well, given that the sheriff just took office on the 5th, I don't know that I have any data for you right now. Okay, uh, so you're saying under Sheriff Hanson. That is his, what he's expressed as his new, uh, new goal. And I haven't acted in that capacity uh, until recently. I've spent the majority of my career in investigative capacity. And I'm only uh, within the last three or four years at it in an administrative and uh, research capacity. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, it was used as one of the, the reasons why. And I thought, gosh, if it's so pressing, surely there's going to be data or you know, let me know like what, that we're making inroads to help these young people. But maybe that's not the question. Well, I'd be help, uh, very happy and encouraged to follow up with, uh, with the body on any data that we do find uh, in the future on that to keep this type of uh, reform going. I'd, I'd like to keep people away from being interrogated. Certainly, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Blood. Other questions for this testifier? Thank you very it. much. Next opponent testifier. Is there anyone else who would like to testify in opposition to LB-135? Next, we'll take up neutral testimony. Anyone testifying today in the neutral position? I do not see any. For the record, then, we have received 14 <laughs> letters, 10 letters in support, and four letters in opposition. And we'll take the closing from Senator John Kavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair DeBoer and members of the committee, this has been an interesting discussion. I appreciate everybody who came to testify on this. There were a couple of questions that I just wanted to make sure and address 
Uh, first off, in terms of states that have adopted this, Illinois, Oregon, and Utah uh, adopted similar law to this. Um, and as to, well, I'll just try and go chronologically, uh, Senator, uh, let's see, where am I here? Um, Holcroft's question. I probably should have given you a better answer during, but I think we got to a little bit. So the, the bill here is not a question of whether it's constitutional or not. The, the, the Supreme Court, as Mr. Eicholt talked about, uh, has set out a standard under which deception is acceptable. Uh, the bill is a policy proposition saying this is a bad idea. So it's not saying that we're violating the Constitution. My bill is merely saying that when you interrogate children and you deceive them in that interrogation, we get bad policy outcomes. And you heard the testimony that from Ms. Craven that it was 35% of wrongful convictions involved a false confession. Uh, from Ms. Salvar, I think it was 30% of wrongful convictions. I think the 35% was for juveniles and 30% maybe was for everyone. And so false confessions lead to wrongful convictions. You get a false confession when you deceive somebody. You give, you, when you lie to them about what the evidence is, people are more likely to lie back to you and tell you what they think you want to hear. Children are much more likely to do that. Uh, I appreciate Officer, I think it was Beryl, being here and, I, and, and the context he gave to this conversation. I would point out that he said that they have uh, a policy that they adhere to most of the time about interviewing kids with their parents present. I would tell you, just sitting here during the hearing, I got emails from defense attorneys in Douglas County telling me juveniles in Douglas County are regularly interviewed without an adult present. I actually recall Senator McKinney brought a bill last session that said they had to have a parent present uh, or had to be notified. So the reason I point to that is we can have policies to regulate and to have uh, officers follow that get good, that, that do not get followed and the harm is done. What we're saying here is, and actually, as a matter of fact, we're not saying officers can't lie. We're saying if they lie, it is not admissible, the statement they, they derive. And that's an answer to your question, Senator Decay, about the exigency question. If you get to a point where it's an emergency and they think that they need to get some information from this kid, they can still lie to them. Just whatever information they give <coughs> as a result of that can't be used in a trial as evidence against that kid. And so that's all we're saying here is this is an evidentiary question, not necessarily whether they can actually do it. And so they have to make that calculus and say, is the exigency of this circumstance such that we need to, to lie to this kid? And so and I think you heard Officer, or I'm sorry, Deputy Wren and Officer uh, Barrel say, this is used sparingly only in the, the most uh, important circumstances that they have policies around how to do it. They, the reason for that is because this is something that we shouldn't be doing. They have policies to constrain their own conduct because they know that they shouldn't be doing it. And so this is a question before this legislature about whether we want to have our law enforcement lying to kids to get to answers. Uh, Officer Barrel gave that example, which I thought was a pretty spot on one. I would suggest that you read uh, Ms. Craven's article. It's very good. It has a great example. It talks about the Beatrice Six case. It talks about another case out of Lincoln that elicited a false confession, both with adults. Both Beatrice Six were adults. The case out of Lincoln was an adult case. Uh, but what he described and what she has in her paper is a breakdown of the read technique, which is a technique under which officers uh, lie. And the phrasing of the what he said sounds very similar to what's described in that technique. And it's, and the reason, the justification he gave for it when I think, I think Senator Ibach maybe asked this question about why do it then, or if you could have gotten, or maybe it was Senator Geis asked about it, if you could have gotten the DNA. His answer was basically expediency or convenience. He said, well, we could have waited, could have come back. They had the person in the room, they had the parent in the room, they wanted to get the interview done at that point in time. That is not a justification to lie to somebody. That is not a justification to potentially elicit a false confession. That is an inconvenience. And the justice system is not meant to be convenient. 
It's meant to get justice. And what happened in the Beatrice Six case is the person who committed that homicide was out on the streets for years. And, and I don't remember if they committed other homicides, but in other cases, the example, well, I think this is in Ms. Craven's case, Ms. Craven's article about the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the Central Park kids. And they were wrongfully convicted after having been uh, given false information. And the person who ultimately committed that crime went on and committed other crimes. And that's what we're talking about here. It's not about expediency. It's not about uh, trying to get to get to this answer. Justice is about getting to the right answer. It's about getting justice for everyone. And when we arrest the wrong person, we convict the wrong person, we think we've solved the case, so potentially you have somebody else out there who's going free, so you have now committed two injustices. And so the data is clear that when you lie to kids, they're more likely to give a false confession. When you give a false confession, you get a, you get a wrongful conviction, the right person goes free and the continuation of the, that problem. So this is a policy question about whether or not we want to continue having uh, people, uh, law enforcement lying to kids or not. They have a tough job, admittedly. They do a great job, and but the, uh, they say they need this tool, but they really, when we use this tool, it gets the wrong outcomes. And so I think, address all items. If you wanted the section of the statute, oh, or Ohio, or I'm sorry, Utah is 80-6-206. Um, oh, and Senator Four, undercover officers. I think the statute is pretty clear, or this proposed statute is pretty clear about this. It says a peace officer interviewing, questioning, or interrogating a juvenile in connection with an investigation. I think that already excludes undercover officers. I do think that there is an easy cleanup to that if we are concerned. Um, and as to the comment that this is overbroad, this is, it says, communicating false facts about the evidence in a case or representing false, fa communicating false facts, false information, or false statements to a juvenile regarding leniency in arrest, prosecution, dis dis disposition of such juvenile in juvenile makes certain statements, or if such juvenile makes such certain statements or admissions during an interview, a questioning or an interrogation. Pretty specific. It applies to these very specific circumstances. And the comments, I mean, that was just an insincere constructive criticism. Because if you want to constructively talk about how to make this narrow, you'd come in and you'd say, we agree that we shouldn't be lying to kids, but this bill is overbroad. What you heard was, we need to lie to kids, and this bill is overbroad. So I'm happy to engage in a conversation that gets us to a place that effectuates the intent of this bill, which is preventing lying to kids. If there is an actual way to constrain this bill, that is overbroad and has those unintended consequences like potentially uh, the undercover officers are implicated, I'm happy to have that conversation and figure out how to fix it. But I will engage in a serious uh, good faith conversation about how to fix this and not an insincere one. Okay, are there questions for Senator Kavanaugh? Senator Blood. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. Senator Kavanaugh, I'm sorry I missed your intro. I'm sure it was awesome, but... Um, so you heard um, Sarpy County say that they supported maybe more training. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I certainly think uh, if we pass this bill, they would have to have some training that says you can't lie to kids, and if you do, that's not admissible evidence. Uh, I think it's a policy question. The fundamentally, the question is, is it a good idea to lie to kids? My my position is no. It gets bad outcomes. It actually undermines the, the integrity and the relationship of law enforcement with the public, the greater public, and so it is a bad idea. So all the training in the world doesn't solve those two problems. Uh, if we pass this law, it will require some training to make sure everybody knows how to implement it properly. All right, fair enough, thank you. Other questions? With that, we'll close the hearing on LB-135 and open the hearing on LB-284. So welcome to your Judiciary Committee, Senator McKinney. Good morning, Vice Chair, the board, and uh, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Terrell McKinney, T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. 
M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y. I represent District 11, North Omaha. And we are here today to discuss LB 284 to adopt the Municipal Police Oversight Act, require maintenance of the Brady and Giglio list, restrict usage of, restrict usage of no-knock warrants, prohibit the collection of data on gang membership, require a bachelor's degree for law enforcement certification, change requirements on law enforcement records, and eliminate the offense of unlawful membership recruitment into an organization. It is 2023, and to date, the United States of America and the state of Nebraska has yet to pass meaningful legislation to hold police accountable. What has happened is a culture of hero worshiping and fear at the expense of countless Americans who have been traumatized, brutalized, harassed, and killed at the hands of those supposedly signed up to protect and serve. Until we tackle the issues with police and those who act as allies gain courage, I'm not sure if it will ever stop. The system of policing is the problem, no matter the officer's race. Racism, white supremacy, and self-hate are substantial factors, as well as the blue wall of silence, cover-ups, and a lack of human decency. Opponents will come in here and say that they can they can police themselves, officers will be at risk, they won't be able to recruit, and a bunch of other outrageous comments about criminals. That being said, a report by the Equal Justice Initiative reported that the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Over the last five decades, our country has criminalized an increasing number of behaviors and targeted black communities and communities of color for over-policing and aggressive prosecution. Law enforcement agencies have outside budgets while other vital community services are underfunded. In too many places, police engage in patterns and practices that undermine public safety and create harm. Thousands of black people were lynched by white mobs in the past, often with the support and involvement of local police and our government did nothing. The system of police and incarceration evolved as a way to maintain racial hierarchy after the Civil War. We will eliminate the scourge of police violence and abuse only if we address the central, centrality of racial injustice and, and inequality in America. Because the United States did not commit to racial equality, slavery did not end in 1865. It evolved into convict leasing and decades of racial terror as far as lynchings. Without an explicit commitment to ending racial injustice, the narratives that sustain it, law enforcement, and other forms of racial control and mistreatment will continue. A system built on the foundations of slave patrols needs to be demolished and rethought. LB 284 is my part in doing so, and I will continue to do so to something meaningful is passed. Omaha nor the state of Nebraska has a pristine history. Although some will act like community police relationships are good, they are not, and the affluent and bourgeoisie do not speak for the masses. On the topic of uh, municipal police oversight, I believe that it is needed because it should be apparent that the police cannot police themselves. An independent oversight with investigatory power should be needed. The current system does not work, and it has no teeth in the city of Omaha. Also, on the topic of Brady Giglio list, often called Brady list after Brady versus Maryland in 1963, where the U.S. Supreme Court case established that these lists are some kind, sometimes called the do not call, no call, disclosure, or exclusionary list. Brady lists are ultimately a list of police employees whose involvement in a case as arresting officer, investigator, witness, or in another role undermines its integrity. These lists maintained by prosecutors should be updated regularly to ensure they include the most recent and comprehensive information. Brady lists are vital public information as they show which police employees have credibility issues and indicate whether prosecutors are following the law by maintaining and updating those records. Juries should know, for instance, if the police employee testifying before them have repeatedly been investigated, for example, for mishandling evidence, especially if they were deciding whether to convict someone based on that evidence. 
Crime victims should know that if police employees are handling their case and had a history, for instance, of course, and false statements from people which could prevent the state from getting the truth. And prosecutors should be aware if a case is unlikely to hold up in court because it relies on unreliable police employee information. Another piece of this is limiting the use of no-knock warrants, which is a matter of public safety for all parties involved, especially those who could potentially be victimized or killed, like Breonna Taylor and like Amir Locke, who was set to move to Omaha before his death at the hands of police. The police will say they don't or only use them in limited situations. Even so, we must have something to, in place to ensure we, play, we protect those police are supposed to protect. Now on the topic of uh, preventing the, the gang list. Honestly speaking, gang lists are inaccurate and it needs to be clarified how someone can be removed. For example, if your family member is in a gang and you are riding in a car with them and he or she gets pulled over, you may be added to this list unbeknownst to you. Now down the line, if you get in trouble or something happens, you'll go to court and the prosecutor would say, uh, Suzanne Geist is in a gang also. Never been in a gang, never had any gang involvement, but only was added to this list because you were riding in a car with your family. Even me as a state senator, I am more than likely on the gang list in the city of Omaha, and I'm a sitting senator right now. On the topic of bachelor's degrees for law enforcement, I have some reasons. And there's been studies, and people will argue there's counter studies that say there's no correlation. But research shows that overall college educated officers generate fewer citizen complaints. They are also terminated less frequently for misconduct and are less likely to use force. And I've been receiving some pushback on this portion of the bill. And shockingly, one of the components I feel is, is really one that I feel is the most sensible. Requiring a bachelor's degree to become a police officer should have an, you should have an education to, to have a license to kill, point blank period. You need one to become a doctor, you need one to become a pilot, you need one to be an engineer, engineer creating machinery that could possibly kill someone. So why not have an, have a license for an occupation that involves direct use of deadly force. This, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why is there a focus on improving recruitment populations over the conservation of lives? What we have is not working. Perhaps the pool that is being, perhaps the pool that is being pulled from needs, to be, perhaps the people that will be eliminated if this becomes law, it needs to be drained especially if it's infested with applicants that shoot or kill first and ask questions later. This has been a wave as of lately and honestly forever. I've seen it, you've seen it, everyone is witnessing the senseless, the senseless taking of lives, all of which has occurred with the current way we're doing things. I'm a firm believer in if you do what you always done, you always get what you always got. As of current, police do not have four years of education to become police officers. That's clearly not working and we have to change something. And, you know, I'm, I, I can't see a person who seeks to become a police officer, goes to college, places themselves amongst the first class of individuals, has this narrow mindedness that we see in, in many communities of color across the country. You get people fresh out the military or fresh from Western Nebraska, thrown into these communities, and they don't have even a baseline foundation for understanding those communities. And that's the problem. And training just doesn't fix that. Because if training worked, the young man that was killed a little after George Floyd was killed, it probably would have been avoided because the lady that killed him was actually a trainer and training somebody during that situation, and she still killed somebody. And another popular word that has been used by the opposition is diversity. I find it quite interesting because if diversity really mattered in policing, the police force would be diverse right now, and it isn't. In fact, according to a Zipia uh, data science team that estimates demographics and statistics for police 
offers in the United States using data for 30 million profiles after extensive research and analysis found within a 10 year span, much hasn't changed and it's been rather constant in terms of diversity. I also think if, if an officer has you know, a four year degree, you can assist with community policing and problems orient, or, oriented policing. I think it also will enable officers to better relate with communities of color and minority communities. I think it will help officers identify the best practices. And hopefully, I hope that requiring them to get more education equips them to be better leaders in the community and are not as, I don't even got the word, but that it's, hopefully they become better people. I understand that it's not an end all be all and they still might kill somebody, but I would feel more comfortable knowing that they went to school and got more education before they were thrown into our communities. Um, a couple years ago, we passed LB51, and it established a database uh, that is maintained by the Crime Commission. And last year, it was brought to my attention that the Crime Commission does not place active officers on this list. The argument was they kind of wanted to avoid making people uncomfortable. <laughs> And it's not also known if active officers would even, even end up on this list, but the fact that they're just not gonna do it is my issue. If, they're, if it's an active officer who has a misconduct on the record, they should be on this list. And many think I hate the police, but honestly, I'm not a hateful person. My motive is about accountability and transparency. I'll speak on a few situations that have shaped my perspective outside of the injustices we see constantly on social media. As a kid, um, we were living in the projects in South Omaha and it was getting raided. The police bust in, woke me up with a gun to my face, took me downstairs and I witnessed them talking to my mom like she was less than human. That's one. On another occasion, I witnessed the police fighting my grandma, rolling up and down a hill, my grandma and two officers. I also have permanent scars on my head from being jumped by the Omaha police. And after they did it, they placed me in a car and asked me did I want more before they took me to the county jail. And, you know, that's what shaped my perspective. I don't like, I don't really care if people think I hate the police. Honestly, if, even if I did, I don't think it's valid. But that's neither here nor there. I believe we need police accountability and transparency in the state of Nebraska. They, they come in here and scream about criminals and the need for new crimes, but they forget to mention the count, countless headlines in the news about officer misconduct, department discrimination, and aligning themselves with white supremacy ideology. We keep seeing it every year, a black man, not even just black people, it's people across the board being killed and brutalized by police. And we don't do anything but stand up and say, we support blue, we love police and hero worshiping, but who's gonna hold them accountable? We need to hold them accountable and you can agree or disagree all you want, but the fact is true. The police have not been held accountable in this country. And it's never, and, and the protests won't stop. Your things about woke people won't stop. None of this will stop until y'all step up to hold police accountable. And I'm going to continue to put bills forward to hold them accountable until we do so. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Senator McKinney? We'll start with Senator Geist. I, I just have one quick one, and it's on page 12, and it was the example you used about me being in the car with the gang, which I get where you're coming from with that. But I wonder if in that legislation, on it, I, it's section two, which talks about that they cannot collect or assemble any data on criminal or a purported criminal, does that mean, or a purported gang member? Gang member. So does that mean any gang member? or just someone that they suspect could be. So I'm, I guess, in short, I'm asking, can they continue to collect data on a gang member, known gang member, just not a purported gang member? 
how do they know somebody's a known gang member without probably repeated experience but there's no system in place to confirm or confirm that these individuals are gang members so based on speculation it, it it i'm not saying there aren't real gang members on the list the problem is how do you get off the list if i'm 50 and i've changed my life why am i still on the gang list okay i well i get that i'm just wondering about current gang members can they collect information i, I don't think they should okay thank you senator guys senator decay thank you senator DeBoer. thank you senator mckinney uh two quick questions you talk about uh, <clears throat> getting a bachelor's degree um to possibly alleviate more financial burden to potential applicants would you consider we've talked about this before would you consider an associate's degree which would be a short a shorter program 18 months or two years compared to a four-year degree i'm honestly open with one i feel like policing needs to be professionalized and that's a huge part of the problem you're pulling people fresh off the streets to become police. So whether it's an associate's degree or bachelor's degree, whatever education that they get, I believe they need it to equip them to be able to interact, especially with minority communities. Thank you. The second question, and for the different ethnic groups that are police officers, you had a graph that shows like 60%. <laughs> um, do those numbers correlate with the number of applicants from different groups that come in or if it's 60 percent white people that are applying for these positions as compared to um you know 18 percent for hispanics do the applicants fall in line with the uh, number of people hired i can't say factually yes or no but i would argue that it's probably low well, I yeah, I just I just don't want to, I don't want people to be rejected because of their ethnic group. I will, so that's why I asked the question. No problem. Thank you, Senator Decay. Other questions? I have a couple for you, Senator McKinney. First, I'm just curious, how old were you when you were pulled from your bed with a gun in your face? Uh, I'm probably eight or nine. I believe. Wow. And when you got the scars on your head, about how old were you? Uh, I was uh, 20, 19. No, I wasn't even 20 yet. I was 19. And then on the issue of the college educated, would you foresee having the police academy training within that program? So like you would get your do you, do you foresee it as you get your college degree and then you go to the police academy or you get your college degree and in the course of getting that degree, you would have a semester that would be the, the training portion that, so maybe like a student teacher, you'd have something like that? Uh, I mean, it could be flexible. Uh, I would honestly like them to have a college degree before they became cops. But in the bill, it, it, it outlines it's about 2037 for every officer to have a four year degree because not all of them have it now. So there will have to be some flexibility. I'm open to it. Interesting. Okay. Uh, other questions? I don't see any. We'll take our first proponent testifier, please. Good morning. Good morning, uh, uh, Vice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll like <clears throat> catch my voice back. Uh, good morning, uh, Vice Chair DeBoer and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jaden Perkins, J A D E N P E R K I N S, and I am uh, a North Omaha community organizer for the Heartland Workers Center. Um, first, I want to thank Senator McKinney for introducing this bill and for being a consistent champion uh, for the community on the issue of police accountability. HWC is here in support of LB 284 because we believe in fighting for 
the issues that affect our underrepresented communities, and that it's time for meaningful police reform in Nebraska. According to the 2020 report by the Brookings Institute, black people are 3.5 times uh, more likely than white people to be killed by police when they are not attacking or have a weapon. Black teenagers are 21 more times uh, likely than white teenagers to be killed by police. And a black person is killed nearly every 40 hours um, by police. I'm sure you all will hear certain people in this room try to minimize the issue of police brutality in our state with the same old bad apples argument. Well, guess what? <clears throat> bad apples <clears throat> come from rotten trees, and rotten trees are law, are law enforcement agencies imbued in structural racism and white supremacy. Standard processes for holding police officers accountable, issuing civil payouts to victims of police violence, and rehiring fired officers are a few of the factors that contribute to the entrenchment of police brutality. Newsflash, police violence happens here too. March of 2013, a neighbor cap captured an uh, arrest on video in which Omaha police officers violently threw young Octavius Johnson to the ground, repeatedly punched him, and held him in a stranglehold. 2014, Jasmine McMiller and a friend were in town for a Terrence Crawford fight and booked a room at the downtown Hilton. Omaha police confronted McMiller in the elevator and uh, in an unbelievable display of prejudice, the police demanded proof that the pair actually had rooms in the hotel. Video evidence shows an officer slamming a handcuffed uh, Mick Miller to, uh, uh, onto a surface uh, with a chokehold after discovering from the front desk that she did have a room at the hotel. Mick Miller spent her holiday evening in jail for disturbing the peace. She had done nothing wrong. Uh, 2017, an indigenous man named Zachary Bearheels was suffering from mental illness when he was kicked off a bus in Omaha, a city he had no knowledge of how to navigate and was forced to walk miles in a blistery, uh, hot June afternoon only to face his demise at the hands of Omaha cops who were not properly trained. May 2020, uh, 72nd and Dodge, peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters, including myself, were subject to expired tear gas and rubber bullets, which were the result of total escalation of police. Um, urging you all to vote this bill out of committee because it's time for police reform in Nebraska. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Are there any questions for this testifier? I do not see any, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. Hello, I'm Sherman Wells, S H E R M A N W E L L S, and I'm here um, in support of LB 284 and uh, its entirety. Give me a moment. Uh, hmm. For the sake of time, um, I'm only going to address a few things. Uh, the oversight board that I believe is um, necessary is going to be responsible for holding the police accountable. Uh, one of them, and that's one of the most important parts of the bill. Uh, my family has actually been impacted by the lack of police accountability in this state. In uh, North Omaha in 1969, Omaha police officer Mark Loder shot and killed my 14-year-old cousin, Vivian Strong as she ran away from him and he received no consequences for that murder. Um, that murder was actually the reason North Omaha was punished for years um, economically for standing up against that injustice. So I believe we need the police without a doubt, but the current method of policing is not working. Uh, the deception of the good old boys and the police is always right is over. And just like the seasons change, um, I believe we need to have a lot of change in the failures in this state and even in this country, uh, the lack of, of the ability to adjust with time is hindering the black community. No longer do people trust the police to investigate themselves. And since the incorporation of body cameras, we have seen what we already know. Nobody is perfect, not even the police. They are humans with a job just like us. And um, they sometimes make mistakes, but when they make a mistake that ends a person's life, they need to be held accountable. The other part of the bill that's further education, which in my opinion, I think all public servants need that. That's a no brainer. Uh, the most important part of the bill to me also is another um, event which took place with our family. Um, 
Karen Wells, who is my cousin, is the mother of Amir Locke. I'm here with her brother and Amir's uncle right here. And currently we have, even before Amir's death, we have been doing a lot of community engagement in the North Omaha community. Amir was killed. He was a law abiding citizen, um, carrying his own gun, sleeping on a family member's couch, which was kicked by the police and he was shot dead. And only after he was shot dead, they realized he was not on the warrant and didn't have nothing to do with nothing. Um, that recklessness of using no knock search warrants is not only jeopardizing the life of the legal gun owner, it's also jeopardizing the lives of our officers um, with the trauma that comes with after the actual shooting. The mental strain it puts on the officers that accidentally shoot and kill an innocent person, uh, their safeties, their family safety, and the years of good police work that they've done is down the drain for one mistake that could have been prevented if we would have just thoroughly thought through the usage of no knock search warrants. It's 2023. Everybody has a firearm. People's walking in targets with firearms. Now, people, contrary to belief, black people do uh, carry and legally carry. And so I think we uh, need to get to a point where we're adjusting with the time and understanding that everybody has a firearm. And I'm here with any questions. All right. Are there questions for this testifier? It seemed like you were about to get to a point. So if you want just okay. another sentence or two. Yeah. Two uh, sentences. Well, and, and the real point is, um, like Senator McKinney said, that the uh, police, the lack of police accountability amongst black people is, is really just tearing us apart. And we want to see, we know police officers are necessary, but we want to see the real relationships established in the communities instead of the judgment that we've been receiving for years. Um, I'm a victim of police brutality. I was picked out wrongly by uh, the police and then beat down. And by the time the beating happened, only after that, when they brought the witness to the scene, um, they determined I was not the person. Um, and so, Throughout the years, we've just been police, I mean, brutalized by the police. So I think everything that the senator has proposed in this bill, I'm a proponent of for the simple fact that it's affecting my family. It currently affects the people in our community. And I have grandkids and kids that this is going to affect if y'all don't take a stand and take this change and make the change um, that's necessary that the senator is proposing in this bill. Thank you very much. Are there any questions now? I don't see any. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Next testifier. Next proponent testifier. Um, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Spike Eichold, S P I K E. Last name is E I C K H O L T. Appearing on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska and the Nebraska Criminal Defense Attorneys Association in support of the bill. Um, the bill does quite a few things. So um, I was thinking of preparing for written testimony, but I honestly didn't know where to start. But I'll just maybe elevate some of the key points of the bill. First, the bill does create sort of a model standard for municipal fleet oversight uh, entity. The city, and it applies to cities of Lincoln and Omaha. There are oversight boards in both Lincoln and Omaha. They vary to a certain extent. In our opinion, this would make these committees or these oversight entities much more robust in the, in the sense that it does provide them with subpoena power. It does provide that they are public bodies and will have public testimony. Omaha's um, state advisory committee is generally not public and their findings aren't public. Uh, Lincoln's is, they do have regular meetings and it is public, but they don't have subpoena and an actual investigatory authority. And this bill provides sort of a template for providing that. The bill also makes some reforms to um, search and arrest warrants and prohibit or at least limit when no knock warrants can be done. If you want to look at what our current law provides for is on page eight lines five through 20. We don't really have the phrase no knock warrant, but judges have the authority when they issue a search warrant to sort of allow law enforcement to not give notice of their authority and purpose, which under the law basically means they can smash in the door. It does provide it can be done sort of with a felony only, but there's not necessarily an actual finding, at least in statute, that that warrant that authorizes no notice to be given needs to be for a violent felony or there's any sort of risk to officers. I will submit that the current practice is, is that when they are applying for a warrant, most judges are going to expect some sort of articulable facts before they will authorize entry without notice. But what Senator McKinney's bill does is actually provide that in statute, which we would submit as a good plan. The bill also requires sort of a maintenance and public accessibility of the Brady and Giglio list. 
and it does require the prosecutor to do it as well. If you're not familiar with Brady versus Maryland, it's basically a duty on the prosecutors and the state to disclose exculpatory information to the defendant, whether the defendant asks for it or the defendant knows about it. And in the context of um, if a police officer, is there some reason to believe that officer's credibility, something they've done on this case or another case, the, the prosecutors have an affirmative duty to disclose to the defense lawyers. I will say, as a practicing defense attorney, I didn't always get Brady disclosed to me. I find out about it sometimes. It was always provided by the prosecutors. In their defense, I think admittedly sometimes prosecutors don't know about it. There are separate offices from the police department. Some of these things are shielded through, due to internal affairs investigations, due to union agreements. But what this bill does is it rightly provides that this will be public and provides a process for having that list be publicly available so that everyone knows. Um, I guess I see my time's up. I'll answer any questions if anyone has any. Are there any questions for this testifier? I do not see any, Mr. Echo. Next proponent testifier. Next person who's here to testify in favor of the bill. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Hutfliss, A-M-Y-H-U-T-F-L-E-S. Um, I'm here in support of LB 284 um, in its entirety. Uh, I echo the sentiments of the folks who have testified ahead of me. Um, I would like to add, there are scenarios, I have a close friend who, um, is in fear of leaving her very abusive husband who is a police officer in the city of Omaha um, for fear that his, um, the police association, like that all of the cops will team up and she will lose her kids and, and she won't be able to get out of it unscathed, even though she's the victim here. So that's another um, scenario that I would really encourage you all to consider um, accountability and transparency for the police department is smart and it's necessary. Um, it could also protect the police officers, but it will help start to mend and bridge this gap that we have. Um, as far as the education part, uh, critical thinking is something that is taught um, and learned when someone has a bachelor's degree or an associate's um, degree, and that can only help um, when police officers in the city have the opportunities to take someone's life, to engage in some critical thinking, um, and that education, that education piece could add to that. Um, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and, and there is a lot of corruption um, in the police department in Puerto Rico, and I could only dream of an opportunity like this to have some um, oversight um, by the community um, and a board like this. So I really, I hope that this passes through the committee. Any questions? Any questions for this testifier? I do not see any today. Thank you so much for being here. Let's have our next proponent testifier. Last call for proponents. Anyone in favor of this bill? Is there anyone who would like to testify in opposition to this bill? Francis Kuhlman, K-U-H-L-M-A-N. This microphone is not sensitive enough for the people in back to hear. You notice I'm six inches away, and they can probably hear me well, but most of your people sit back here and talk about this volume, and they can't, they can't hear and you know, understand. So please consider changing that in the future. I'm against this bill as it's currently written 
because why, why limit the field of hirees just from those who graduated from college? I think that's a mistake. Um, secondly, uh, college does not encourage critical thinking from what I've seen. College stifles critical thinking. If you want to make the grade in college, you're going to pair it back to that professor, what the book says or what he wants you to hear. Um, so that's um, a myth, I believe. So I, I'm against this as currently written. And secondly, um, are we really not going to collect gang, me gang member data? That is just such a huge mistake, in my opinion. Okay, now, <clears throat> the guy that testified last set of uh, first, I guess, said, I'm probably on a gang list. Well, he may be, but um, that just means that the gang list is sloppily kept. And if he thinks he's on a gang list, he needs to file an affidavit in court saying, you know, either I used to be in a gang, but now I'm no longer, or I've never been in such and such a gang, you know, et cetera, and I swear to it this day, you know, January, whatever, February, whatever, so that um, cops will know what's, what the affidavit says when they arrest him or, or when, when he's pulled over and, okay, he's, he's not on the gang list, so we don't need to give him special treatment. When he's in court testifying, maybe he's been accused of a crime, it's an easy matter to take the stand and say, no, I'm not on a gang. Uh, so, you know, that's swearing under oath. Our voter registration rolls contain many dead people and people that have moved out of state, but no one is, they're not perfect. That just means we need to true up our voter registration rolls, but no one is saying do away with the voter reggae rolls. So let's not do away with the with people that are members of gangs either. It's easy to prove whether they're in a gang. Well, I shouldn't say easy, but it's possible. Cell phone data, you can track whether they've been to the gang house 50 times in the last two years. Was there a gangland murder, you know, that's happened? Well, that, were they there? Check on, check on their cell phone record there. Or their criminal record, have they hanged out with and committed fellow crimes with fellow gang members? Do they have the MS-13 tattoo on their cheek, et cetera? It's not impossible to prove that someone's in a gang. Any questions? Any questions for this testifier? I do not see any, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Next opponent testifier. <coughs> Good afternoon. Vice Chair uh, DeBoer. Members of the Judiciary Committee, LB 284 is a well-intentioned bill designed to improve police accountability. The Lincoln Police Department incorporates the public into many of our policy decisions, strategic plans, and promotional processes. Community oversight has been embedded in our agency's culture since 1975 with the creation of the Citizen Police Advisory Board. Mayoral appointed community representatives of the C CPAP have investigated complaints, listened to public concerns, influenced department policies and procedures, and strengthened the relationship between our agency and the community. LB 284 will eliminate the current established practice. We support training requirements for all commissioned officers, however, disagree with the requirement of a degree. This requirement disregards the value of life experience and limits candidates to those who can afford a four-year degree. If a member does not achieve a degree by the designated time frame, will we be firing these members? It will adversely impact low income, communities of color, and members of the community who have children or single parents. Having a degree does not automatically make you a better police officer. In an age where police agencies already struggle with recruitment for diverse membership, LB 284 would further hinder our efforts. LB 284 is also an unfounded mandate placing financial burden on local government to absorb the costs of independent investigators, legal counsel, and costs associated with this oversight body. These citizen review boards, given unchecked authority, will eliminate the ability for police chiefs to hold their membership accountable and eliminates officers' due process. This legislation prohibits police agencies from collecting, assembling, or preserving data related to gang status or membership and requires the destruction of all current data. Any intelligence data gathered throughout the course of an investigation can prove invaluable for future investigations. Many gang-related crimes are related to feuds between groups. 
Some of these conflicts are related to tribe or regional conflict from their country of origin. Law enforcement's knowledge of their past relationships and disputes can often provide a quick, re quick resolution, prevent further retaliation and additional victims. Our goal is prevention and working with community leaders to develop programs to lead youth away from gangs. We have created a process which has been implemented for years to evaluate and remove those who do not have gang-related activity off such lists. I strongly urge you to oppose passage of LB 284 in its current form. We're happy to continue this conversation to find an acceptable balance that captures the intent of the bill while still addressing the impacts to public safety. All right, thank you very much. Are there questions for this testifier? Senator Iba. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, the, the thought or the idea of having a bachelor's degree intrigues me. So I Googled, are, do any states require a bachelor's degree to be a police officer? And there apparently are none. Is yes. that correct as far yes. as you know? And do you have officers on your force currently that have bachelor's degree or, or the equivalent? We do. We also have um, individuals that have master's degrees. I think the you know, the idea that um, to hire people is to have a degree is, is not really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a police officer today. I got my degree, I finished my degree years ago, five or six years ago. I have dyslexia, I had to deal with that through school. Um, I'm revealing too much right now. <laughs> but you know, it's, there's some circumstances in life in which prevents you from doing that. Getting a degree, I would have done, but my partner at the time wanted to go and further her education at the time. So we chose financially for her to go as opposed to me when I was a police officer at the time. So there's many different life experiences that one has in order to, you know, it doesn't mean you're a good police officer. I've seen plenty of people with higher education that are police officers that are not as good as people that have life experience itself. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? I was raising my hand. <laughs> so you have a question for me? Let's go. Apparently I do. <laughs> Senator DeBoer. Um, so uh, we were talking about this education piece. Uh, maybe not then the bachelor's degree, whatever, I can understand that I have most of my career been a college professor. I don't think it's maybe so much uh, brainwashing as perhaps some others might, but that might be just an occupational hazard of my own belief. But I wonder if maybe there might be a way to, um, we, we keep talking about training, 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 training. If there might be a way to add some measure of uh, education before the academy, during the academy, something like that. Would you be open to looking at adding more to the academy process? Absolutely. I do think that there are some junior colleges that could have a, a process to for people to enter into law enforcement. Uh, continuing education is essential. Making sure that we are, are understanding communities, understand all that training has to be in our curriculum. But continuing education has to be there. It can't just be one training when you're in the academy and then 10 years later you're getting another training. It has to be continuous and it has to be updated. We shouldn't be relying on training curriculums that were written 20 years ago, which is has happened. And so we need to make sure that we are in a place as a profession that we have the highest standards when it comes to the education that we're providing both in the academy and throughout someone's career. How long is the academy? How You're going to ask me that question. Ugh. So um, right now it's six months. Uh, we're looking to to really further that uh, more uh, to provide, you know, duty to intervene is, is something that has been in discussion um, and that is something we've implemented now. It's all these classes have to be reviewed um, and I hope to to really have a, a strong curriculum for our, our new members. Can you give me a sense of what the structure is like? Um, what percentage of the time in the academy is spent doing sort of hands-on training on, I don't know, driving and weaponry and et cetera? And what percentage is sitting in a classroom learning about um, communities and about 
police theory and some of those kinds of things? Right, I can send you our curriculum. Um, okay. But you know, overall, we have a lot of time in the classroom because you have to learn about law, you have to learn about arrests, uh, Fourth Amendment, a lot of different things that you have to learn. Yes, there's hands-on, a portion of it, um, and then driving. And then at the range, we have intense uh, conversation and applying de-escalation tactics throughout the entire academy uh, because that's important. You don't, when I came in in the 90s in law enforcement, you, you rush in and you grab people out of a car. That was the training. That's what you did. Today, it's time and distance. It's you're taking your time. You're looking at the totality of the circumstances and you're making a decision. And so we try to put that into our, our curriculum and, and really reinforce that with everyday training. Okay, thank you. Senator Geist has a question. Thank you, I do have a question. If you would speak to, to training as it's ongoing, mm -hmm. and maybe in addition to that, what you do specifically for cultural training for <coughs> different populations. So we, um, so as far as the, the training goes, we have uh, the state, every state has their own um, requirements for recertification every year. So our officers go uh, to training um, and take that <coughs> curriculum, mm -hmm. but we offer additional training. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we uh, are, when I came in, we have our SROs that have mandatory training, uh, patrolling the teen, teen brain, which is very important in my mind because they're interacting with uh, youth almost every single day. Um, but you know, we do have some curriculum in which is required by the state, but also by our department. Um, and the second question, I'm sorry, was about cult, specific to cultural culture. training. So we have that in the academy as well, um, and it is a it is part of our review for officers mm -hmm. that they are interacting and going to community groups. They're very Lincoln uh, Police Department. You know, I've said this before, is I'm very proud of them because they are going to the different community groups and they're always interacting with different communities. But overall, the training in the academy is intense because we partner with these different different community groups like the Malone Center. And so it's an important part of our training and we always try to hit that home okay. and have that community engagement as strong as we can. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Senator Decay. Thank you, Senator DeVore. Uh, in, in the academy, how many, what's the average size of classes that start the academy and what's either the graduation rate or the fallout rate per class? Yeah, so we have, uh, right now we have 11 members in the academy. We go up to 25. What we try to do is we want the best. Uh, we've, we <coughs> go over these packets of individuals that either are laterals or coming into the profession and we re review whether or not they are to the standard that we have, that we want. And, and you know, unfortunately there are some people that this is just not at this time in their life that they're cut out for this job. But we try to have up to 25. Um, you know, a lot of people are retiring right now. A lot of people, because of everything that's happened in the last five years, that they're changing professions overall. But we really want the best of the best. Those that can think through different uh, situations. They have to go through a polygraph. They have to go through a psych. If the person that did the psych tells me that they're not ready, um, or they have some concerns, then we listen to that. We don't, I can fill a class every six months, but we have to have the right people doing this job. Other questions for this testifier? Do not see any, so thank, thank you very, very much, much for being here. Next opponent testifier. Good afternoon, Vice Chair DeBoer and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Diane Sabat Karine, D I A N E S A B A T K A hyphen R I N E. I'm the interim director of the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services. I'm here today to provide testimony in opposition to Section 20 of LB 284. Our department identifies individuals who are what we call security threat groups. These, groups that re these are groups that repeatedly engage in criminal activities such as trafficking, directing violence, or participating in violence. Under this bill, our department could no longer maintain data on these groups. 
Without this data, we cannot manage our facility safely because we could not make informed decisions regarding things like housing or job assignments. For example, without this information, we could unknowingly assign inmates to the same cell or in, who are in opposing security threat groups. This could increase the likelihood of serious incidents, especially considering that in other states there have been instances where security threat group activity escalated into significant disruption to safe operations or in some cases, a riot. NDCS has a formalized process to ensure that our security threat group data is reliable. We use a scoring instrument that documents and validates that an individual is a member of a security threat group. Groups will continue to cause disturbances in our facilities, even if we remove this data. This bill will leave the department unprepared and unable to determine how to safely house inmates and keep our safe staff safe inside. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Is there any, are there any questions for this witness? No questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for being here. Next opponent testifier. <laughs> Good afternoon, Senators. Appreciate your time this afternoon. My name is Scott Gray, S-C-O-T-T, -T, Gray, G-R-A-Y. I'm Deputy Chief of the Omaha Police Department. The Omaha Police Department is committed to excellence in policing, maintaining high ethical standards, being responsive to the community, and promptly addressing concerns. We are always open to working with elected officials on legislation that is beneficial to the community and our officers. Unfortunately, we must oppose LB 284 in its current form for the following reasons. Regarding civilian oversight, Omaha already adheres to national best practices on civilian oversight. We have a civilian complaint review board that already consists of seven members from the community, plus existing administrative staff, which consists of an Omaha Police Department command officer, a representative from Human Rights and Relations, and the City Law Department. This bill imposes significant financial costs on the citizens of Omaha. It requires hi hiring of a dedicated staff of investigators. And currently in our internal affairs division, we have five dedicated investigators. So assuming uh, a similar model that would be over $500,000 in impact uh, to the citizens of Omaha for the additional staff of investigators. This would likely take away funding from other departments or programs. In Omaha's, <clears throat> excuse me, sexual harassment and discrimination claims are already independently investigated by the Human Resources Department. <clears throat> in the case of officer-involved shootings, Omaha utilizes investigators from other agencies to provide independent oversight. All in-custody deaths are investigated by a grand jury per existing state law. Policing standards, patterns, and practices are al already defined in law and monitored by the Police Standards Advisory Council. There are also a number of concerns regarding constitutionality, primarily due to guarantee protections. The current investigative process managed by the police chief works very effectively and already has established legal, legal processes in place. Regarding the Brady Giglio list, we established a list about five years ago. It's maintained by the city prosecutor's office, updated regularly and accessible by all attorneys. Regarding no-knock warrants, OPD already uses them very sparingly, and we meet or exceed national best practices in the area. We have command approval. They're served by SWAT. They're approved by a judge. They have body-worn cameras, clear insignia, and we use embedded tactical medics. We believe this is a redundant portion of the law and limits flexibility needed for violent tactical encounters. Regarding the gang program, this is a valuable intelligence tool. Information in it is not publicly available. This valuable information on criminal associations and crime trends, it's necessary to maintain a level of violent crime suppression that we have achieved in Omaha. Just quickly, uh, regarding the bachelor's degree requirement, we're not necessarily opposed to this, just the way it's stated in its current form. We would prefer to see some kind of state-funded hiring incentive in, in its place. In conclusion, I'll say this. The Omaha Police Department needs your help. We need help attracting, recruiting, and retaining highly qualified, ethical, and diverse candidates to fill our ranks 
and maintain the excellent level of public safety that Omaha enjoys. This bill does not accomplish this and may have the opposite effect. We are prepared to work with this committee and the entire legislative body to craft legislation that achieves our common goals. I thank you and welcome any questions. Any questions, Senator Geis? I'm curious, I, I'll ask you the same as I asked the um, Lincoln Police Chief, about your training specifically um, cultural. Do you have specific training that teaches your officers how to respond in a, in a diverse cultural environment? We do. We, uh, so they do receive that in the basic academy, and then we also have annual in-service training programs that address that as well. And there's, um, I believe it was last year, was added additional state mandated data training and cultural competent, competency and diversity issues. So that uh, is, is covered regularly. Uh, we spent a lot of training time also on uh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a robust co-responder program in, in our department. May I ask about yeah. the mental health issues? Is that yeah. um, specific to the community that, that you're working with or is that for the officers themselves? Is that go both ways? Yeah, we have both. We, we have an entire, it's called the core unit. It's basically a, a behavioral health unit that looks at both sides of it. So we have peer support for the, the officers, for the public. We have the co-responder program. We have a crisis response team, um, just a, a number of different uh, opportunities to de-escalate situations that involve mental health. Uh, and, and the co-responders really, they're, they're all licensed mental health practitioners. Uh, so they're civilians, not police officers. They go out with the police officers on calls. Mm -hmm. um, but they are really good at um, setting up follow-up follow plans and diverting uh, people who are in mental health crisis from um, using up police force resources or fire resources and that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Geist. Any other questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you so much. Next opponent. Welcome. Thank you. Senator DeVore, members of the committee, my name is Lynn Rex, L-Y-N-N-R-E-X, representing the League of Nebraska Municipalities. We're here today in opposition to this bill. As always, we're prepared to work with the committee and also, of course, Senator McKinney. One of the reasons I'd like to focus on today in terms of why we're opposing this has to do with the requirements uh, for the certificate, certification, if you will, um, and also the graduate degree and undergraduate degree. I'm looking at page 14, lines 3 to 4. The applicant has a bachelor's degree or higher from an accredited college or university. Then going on to page 17, uh, lines 18 through 23. In essence, even our current officers, in order to maintain certification as a law enforcement officer, a person shall either hold a bachelor's degree or higher degree from an accredited college or university, or enroll in an accredited college or university and obtain a bachelor's degree or higher by September 1, 2037. Again, uh, this is no reflection on those that have a college degree, but I would just underscore the point by the police chief of Lincoln, Nebraska. Some of our best officers don't have college degrees, and that's just secondhand anecdotal from our police chiefs from first class cities and second class cities across the state of Nebraska. This is an issue dealing with attraction and retention of officers. While you're holding these hearings today, the Revenue Committee is holding a hearing on Senator Bozard's bill, LB 447 to have law enforcement attraction and retention and change that and morph it to also include firefighters across the state because of the issues dealing with firefighters and police officers. Um, so in anticipation of this hearing, this is not comprehensive, but we did a quick survey of our members. Um, there, as you know, there are 529 cities and villages in the state of Nebraska. 380 of those are villages on paper population 100 to 800. We have 31 cities with a population of 5,000 and up. For example, Shadron, Kearney, uh, Columbus, and so forth. And this is basically from those first class cities, just to give you an idea. So this is nothing comprehensive, but it's 15 of the 31 first class cities that could respond within just minutes <laughs> of a survey. So let me just uh, respond to you in terms of what we have um, acquired. Does your city have trouble attracting and or retaining full-time paid police officers? Those that said yes. Holdridge, Blair, South Sioux City, Grand Island, Gehring, La Vista, McCook, Shadron, Columbus, Beatrice, and York. Those that said no, 
Papillion, Retina, Carney, and Crete. And of course, this is not comprehensive, but those numbers then would show of those that responded, of the 15 of the 31 cities that responded, 73.33% responded, yes, they have trouble attracting and retaining police officers. So we do think that this committee did a really great thing with passage of LB51. The legislature came out of this committee, passed that. It was a training bill uh, for law enforcement in 2021. And that bill, you know, I'm at closure here, but it had a number of provisions in it. And I'm happy to respond to any questions you might have. All right. Are there any questions? Doesn't look like any. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for your consideration. We'll have the next opponent testifier. <coughs> Good afternoon, Vice Chair DeBoer. Senators of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Corey O'Brien. It's C-O-R-E-Y-O, Oscar B-R-I-E-N. I'm Chief Prosecutor in the Nebraska Attorney General's Office. And today I appear on behalf of the Attorney General, Mike Hilgers, and the Nebraska Attorney General's Office in opposition to LB 284. While the Attorney General's Office would echo many of the sentiments made by the previous opposition testifiers, I'd like to use this opportunity to highlight one section of the bill in particular. Uh, that provision is about the disclosure publicly of Brady Giglio lists. Um, these lists are really kept for the benefit of prosecutors and prosecutors alone, because it is our sole obligation to provide that information uh, about potentially exculpatory evidence. Um, we have three reasons why we're really um, opposed to this. Um, in particular, you know, prosecutors are apt to give these lists or turn over, disclose information from these lists uh, on the side of caution because of the severe consequences that can befall us if we don't turn them over. For instance, the individual can get a retrial, the charges might be dismissed, um, there might be a mistrial. Uh, in fact, they can be held um, accountable before the, uh, the bar for failing to honor the rules of professional responsibility if I don't disclose this. So I'm apt to give over that information more times than not. Uh, I'll give you some examples from some real life cases that I've given over information just based upon simply allegations uh, of the officer. I've disclosed giggly information about an officer for adding 15 minutes to his timesheet, um, about an officer who told his supervisor he wasn't hurt during an altercation and, and eventually went to the ER complaining of a stiff neck. Uh, and then uh, turned over information based upon just simply a provocative joke that was told off duty. Secondly, we're concerned about the fact that there's no um, consistency amongst agencies uh, in terms of what is considered giggly or, or not. Uh, for instance, in the federal system, they consider um, you know somebody that was involved in a search violation um, to be uh, Brady Giglio. Also, there's a lack of due process for the officers. The last thing I wanted to add is that something no, nobody else added, and that is the bill calls for the outright repeal of a piece of legislation that was passed in 2009 um, regarding unlawful gang, or I'm sorry, membership recruitment. Um, that has been a valuable tool for law enforcement, and we uh, like not to see that be repealed. Thank you, and I, I'd uh, be open to any questions anybody has. Are there any questions for this testifier? I, I do have a question for you. Yes. So uh, you've explained why I think there might be some problems with the Brady Giglio. Is there another list or way of creating a list that might get at what the senator is, is looking to get at here? Are well, I think he's already done that with the list that the crime commission is supposed to put forward and i think the design is to get law enforcement officers identified of questionable character or unfitness um again this is not a reliable list uh, these brady giglio lists are simply 
a reminder to other people at my office, hey, look, we may have a problem here. You might need to disclose this. If we don't disclose this, we might risk losing the case. And so what I would say is that a lot of times, you know, they may have, people that are on the Giglio list may have some credibility or character issues, and we may have to disclose that. And not in every case of somebody that's on a Brady Giglio list do I provide that information. Um, so, for instance, if all the officer did in my particular case is uh, go out and look for surveillance video and he wasn't really an inter instrumental part in the investigation and all he did was, you know, fudge his time sheet by 15 minutes, I'm probably not going to provide that disclosure that I might do so if he's a more involved witness in the case. So, again, they're not a reliable list of bad actors. Um, and so I think that that list already exists from the prior legislation that was passed, I think it was last year. And do you know if the Crime Commission has put that list together? I have no idea. If they okay. have I not. just thought maybe you'd know offhand. I, I gathered from his testimony that they have, but there's some issues with them not providing information about officers that are currently still actively officers. And that doesn't surprise me, given what I know about those lists, is that uh, there really is no mechanism under existing law to suspend or revoke somebody, I'm sorry, or suspend somebody's license, a law enforcement officer's license. Basically, they're going to be somebody that has their certificate uh, revoked. And so it's taken away from them. So they're not going to be actively police officers anymore. So it would not surprise me that the list consists of solely people who are no longer employed as law enforcement because they can't be employed if they don't have a certification. Are there other questions? Thank you. Are there other questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you. Next opponent testifier. Can I see a raise of hands? How many more folks are uh, coming to testify? Okay, thank you. Senator DeBoer and all members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jeff Sorensen, J-E-F-F, Sorensen, S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N, and I'm the president of the Lincoln Police Union. Today, I'm here to rep represent the exceptional men and women of the Lincoln Police Union. The police union would like to express our strong opposition to LB 284. We believe any bill of this nature would have disastrous effects on hiring and retention, employee morale, and community safety. There are a number of concerns we have with this bill, which I will work to address. We echo the opinion and objections to any police oversight committee. The Lincoln Police Department and Chief Ewins has already articulated. We object to adding extra and unnecessary qualifications for our officers, which would make recruitment and retention of officers more difficult. This would have a negative impact on any previous efforts to improve law enforcement recruitment and retention this committee has already worked towards in the last couple of years. We oppose placing an officer's name on any public Brady and Giglio list. This bill does nothing to address what criteria for being on the list would be, no process for determining when disclosure is required, and most importantly, the bill does not address any appeals process when an officer wants to contest any allegations. Intelligence-led policing is a current policing model utilized to prevent criminal activity before it occurs by placing law enforcement resources in specific areas identified by said intelligence. A gang database is just one element that that system uh, has. The intelligence helps us identify conflicts between individuals, groups, and areas in which those problems are likely to occur. Gang violence and gun possession is real. Having the ability to put associations together greatly adds in our efforts to prevent violence from occurring, sometimes even saving a life. This intelligence-based system is also an aid in identifying where prevention resources should be directed. These prevention efforts work to reduce criminal activity before it happens and reduce the number of youth and young adults being placed into the criminal justice system. The elimination of the gang database would be detrimental to law enforcement efforts to reduce community violence. The unlawful recruitment statute states, end quote, knowingly and intentionally coerces, intimidates, threatens, or inflicts bodily harm. 
in an effort to entice one to join or to prevent one from leaving a criminal organization. I would ask each of you, aren't these all things that we want to protect our youth from? Removing this statue only serves to protect those preying on our youth and our vulnerable. I'd like to remind you that all of the hard work and dedication of our officers exemplified on a daily basis. They sacrifice a lot to serve. They work shifts that cover 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and frequently miss family events and milestones. Please do not make their jobs any harder or more stressful it is expected the community should demand hard work and excellent service from us. Putting limits on our abilities to problem solve only makes our job harder and the communities we serve less safe. The Lincoln Police Union strongly opposes LB uh, 284, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Next opponent. <coughs> Good afternoon, Vice Chair Gore and members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, my name is Elaine Menzel. It's E-L-A-I-N-E, M-E-N-Z-E-L. Appearing here today on behalf of the Nebraska Association of County Officials in opposition to just one component of the larger bill that you're being presented to um, with LB 284, and that relates to the provision that would require the bachelor's degree for reasons that you've heard from Chief Ewens spoke about it previously, and she did a good job describing some of the complications that would arise in some of the <coughs> sheriff's law enforcement offices. But then also Lynn Rex would also describe many of the issues that we deal with with respect to the recruitment of staff persons for law enforcement at this time. Last year, the Judiciary Committee, as well as Revenue, heard many bills that were addressing some of the issues that we're facing with respect to recruitment and those types of things. We appreciate you having addressed some of those issues and hope that can work to continue to build those things. We are appreciative to Senator McKinney for bringing some of these issues forward, and we hope to continue to work with him and the Judiciary Committee. With that said, there's also the unfunded mandates aspect that I would, I know Chief Ewens mentioned and would like to address that as well. So any questions, I'd be glad to answer them if I can. Are there any questions from Spring Grove? I do not see any. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Next opponent. Good morning, you members of the committee, vice chair. My name is William Rin. William is spelled W I L L I A M Rin R I N N. I'm the chief deputy of administration for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Um, I do have some prepared notes here for me that I was going to go through today. Uh, but I think that I will probably go off script. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the, the sheriff's position is seen as genuine and that I, uh, in my eagerness to be prepared, I don't seem uh, disingenuous. So my, our letter will stand for it. Um, I think the best way to start is that the sheriff's office uh, does stand opposed to this bill as it is in current form. But starting with the positive, um, I believe uh, very strongly in education and the bachelor's degree concept uh, is actually a strong one uh, by the senator. Um, personally, my own children, I have two that are just finishing up uh, at the same time uh, with their bachelor's degree. And even over the last four years, uh, my wife and I have seen their growth and their eyes being open to different things and their open-mindedness. Um, the exact way uh, in being in the recruiting field and uh, hiring portions of the sheriff's office, we do seem to hire uh, more worldly officers when they do have degrees and they seem to fare better on our testing process. Um, where the problem lies is in how to achieve that. I believe there's a bill on the floor right now uh, for under 447 to assist with uh, payment for those things. Um, so we're headed in the right direction, uh, the execution of which needs to be looked at heavily. With regard to the new knock search warrant, um, 
at this concept. Uh, we're really uh, not opposition with that as the sheriff's office has standards in place that are above, if not uh, above what are being, impo uh, being proposed right now. Uh, the only uh, limitations that it pr uh, proposes for us is that we do have some partnerships with federal task force that uh, stringently guide how we use uh, body cams and how we um, execute those warrants. So that may eliminate some of those opportunities for us. Um, with regard to the author involved shootings, um, I've been involved in investigations either with the sheriff's office or the military for about 30 years, specifically with regard to officer involved shootings and death involving uh, use of force. Um, I can tell you that I personally had to recommend charges against officers and corrections officers. Um, it is not something that I liked doing, uh, but I did it and I would continue to do it if I was still in that position because it's necessary and no one is above the law. Um, and that is pretty much all I have to say about those items. I will take questions uh, for the sheriff. If they really have. Any questions for this testifier? Doesn't look like it. So nope. thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Next opponent testifier. Hello again, members of the committee senators. My name is Matt Barral, M-A-T-T-B-A-R-R-A-L-L. -L. I am the vice president for the Nebraska Fraternal Order of Police, here speaking in uh, solid opposition to LB 284. Uh, for most of the reasons that have already been stated by those in positions that are far more educated than I am, uh, but what I will speak to are two of the things that they have been spoken about. One is the college degree. I have a four-year degree. It was from an excellent university in the state of California. I did find that it gave me very good critical thinking skills, which I think have helped me as a law enforcement officer. However, I know many, many law enforcement officers who did not have the benefits that I had <coughs> growing up to get that four-year degree. I think that making that and put, putting that in place would severely limit some of the excellent officers that we could obtain, not based on education, but based on economic background. I think we would lose diversity. I also think that Senator McKinney missed a major part when he did not allow any sort of exemption for military service. If you have ever served in the military, it is one of the most diverse areas of government that are known to mankind. And many of our very good officers that served four, six, eight, 20 years in the military have never had college degrees and yet they are excellent officers. In addition to that, I wanted to speak very quickly on officer involved shooting investigations. I have served on multiple officer involved shootings as well as in custody deaths and the training is very specialized to have a group that would be able to investigate those without that specialized training it makes no sense um, you need use of force training you need force science training you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of that reasonable officer and unfortunately i think this bill doesn't do that um, some of you may know, I was one of the main authors of LB 51. Um, the State Fraternal Order of Police is dedicated to police improvement, to law enforcement improvement. So we would be happy to sit down. We were never asked um, for anything about this bill, but we would be happy to sit down and talk about police improvement in law enforcement in the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Don't see me saying your name, so. Thank you very much. Next opponent testifier. Anyone else who would like to testify in opposition to the bill? Now we'll move to neutral testimony. Is there anyone who would like to testify in a neutral position? Welcome. Good afternoon and thank you guys for hanging in there. 
My name is Connie S. Edmond, C-O-N-N-I-E-S-E-D-M-O-N-D, and I'm a commissioner for the Commission on African American Affairs. I'm here to enter testimony in a neutral position for LB-284 introduced by Senator McKinney, and we appreciate his efforts. We believe in the need of transparency, accountability, and public safety, which includes the safety of law enforcement and the citizens. Brady and Giglio List provides transparency. Transparency builds trust, and trust builds communities. No knock warrants. No knock warrants were created to assist with the war on drugs, and the surprise nature of these warrants was meant to help law enforcement disrupt criminal activity without giving a perpetrator time to react. In 2020, the New York Times investigation found that at least 94 civilians and 13 law enforcement officers died as the result of no-knock warrants. As of February 2022, 27 states and 22 cities have some kind of restrictions on no-knock warrants. Four states, Oregon, Connecticut, Virginia, and Florida have outright banned the use of no-knock warrants. Currently, there are no provisions that would prohibit the use of a no-knock warrant to pursue a perpetrator that is suspected to be located at a residence on or premise in which the perpetrator is not a legal owner or record or tenant on that lease, thus creating a high level of risk for everyone involved. Where there is risk, one must consider the safety aspect as well. The history of no-knock warrants would suggest that they create a threat to public safety, thus raising the question of putting parameters around the use of a tactic that poses a threat is in the best interest of public safety as opposed to eliminating the threat altogether. In regards to requiring a bachelor's degree to gain admission to a law enforcement training academy, statistics indicate that police officers who have obtained higher education tend to be better officers and have a greater understanding of the community. Today, every police officer in the nation goes through a formalized certification course at a police academy that includes tactical, behavioral, community relations, and ethical skills. I believe the police academy on average is equivalent to 720 course hours, and the average hours to attain a bachelor's degree is 120 credit hours. Several states work with community college to provide law enforcement certification programs. If the police departments have data on areas of performance deficiencies that impact their ability to perform their jobs in a professional and transparent manner, then perhaps the data should be reviewed to determine areas in which the curriculum in the police academy should be enhanced. I raise the question of how we can work in collaboration to form police and community partnerships that hold each party accountable for the same goals, establishing standards, maintaining order, resolving disputes, and protecting liberties and rights. Thank you to Senator McKinney for inducing this bill to bring awareness to these issues. Thank you for your continued service as senators, and thank you for the opportunity to allow me to testify today. Thank you. Are there any questions, Senator Geist? Um, I'm curious. Uh, I was, as I was asking the, the police chiefs or deputy chief in the case of Omaha, um, and you were referring to um, additional uh, schooling. Uh -huh. um, I'm wondering if it, I'm hearing um, what North Omaha community is saying, and I'm wondering if additional training, understanding, cultural uh, immersion, or whatever the terminology would be for officers in specific uh, cultural environments that they will encounter in their whatever city or town they happen to be in. If, if you believe that integrating that into their training and ongoing training might help some of the issues that are being addressed today. Thank you for the question, Senator Geist, because that allows me to talk another minute about things I can get to talk about. <laughs> so um, I do believe that would be helpful. One such idea that I had is, you know, we have this concept of scared straight, where we would take young individuals and put them, take them through the, the juvenile system to scare them into living a straight uh, legal life, right? On the reverse, in police academies, it would be helpful for police to have known victims of police misconduct, educate them on the impact and the experience that, that it's had on their life. That's real life training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Senator Blood. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. But didn't that Scared Straight program fail? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, I, I don't know. But to Senator Guy's point, the, the police academy, if it's lacking a cultural awareness or an awareness of community interaction, that needs to be part of the academy. We can't just equip people with tactical skills and not equip them with life skills, emotional, social learning, and awareness of interacting with people in the community. Yeah, yeah I don't disagree with that either. But the, the concern that I continue to have, you know, we always say things like kids can't be what they can't see. Like, uh -huh. I mean, we do know that there's still an issue that we're not yet at that point where we're hiring what the demographic is in, in certain communities. Yeah. Would you say that that's accurate? That's very accurate. Yes. Thank you. But I also think, if I may, I also think, too, police can understand what they've never experienced. And so for those people who have been a victim of police violence to understand, you know, facing your accuser, there's a lot to be said for that. But can you teach empathy? Well, I think I taught my kids very well to be empathetic, so yes. So since you've drag out the conversation beyond my initial question. <laughs> Explain the difference to me between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for a situation or something. Empathy is actually experiencing it and sharing that same experience with that person. You can only be empathetic if you've experienced that. And a lot of times you cannot be empathetic to people who have, a, who have been abused by law enforcement if you have never been in that situation. And I think we all are sympathetic when we see Tyree Nichols and police brutality. We're all sympathetic to a person being mistreated or abused. We're all sympathetic, but we can't be empathetic if we've never been that person on the bottom of that pile getting beat by a baton or being tased by a taser. You can't be sympathetic to that. We'll have to talk via email because okay. I don't agree with that definition, but I was curious since you brought that up. So That's okay. We can, and, we and, can and, agree and, to disagree. And, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I was just always, I used to do crisis counseling. So I, I think the definition is a little different. Um, and maybe that's where part of the disconnect is on Senator McKinney's bill. So maybe there's more middle ground than you think. So Could be. We'll have to see. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Senator Holcroft. Thank you, Vice Chair DeBoer. And thank you for your testimony, very well delivered. Can you tell me more about your organization, who you represent, how you're selected, come together? Yes, thank you for asking. So um, under Governor Ricketts, he established, the bill was actually introduced by McKinney and Wayne. The uh, Commission on African American Affairs Commission was just put into legislation in 2020. We had never had a commission that represented the interest of African American affairs in the state of Nebraska. So we are just a new commission forming to promote the rights and the advantages for economic, healthy, safety, wealth, and education for black people in the state of Nebraska. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Are there other questions? I, I do have one for you. Is there a concern? It seems like maybe you'd be in favor of the, the bachelor's degree required for entrance into the um, academy. Is that accurate i would be in favor a favor of education that enhances but not eliminates or discriminates for people to be a part of wanting to serve our community so you know a lot of states work in collaborations with community colleges with a certification program along with an associate's degree i do believe a degree of education teaches you things that you would not normally get by bypassing that education that's, that was that sort of answered my question because I was going to ask if that would eliminate or provide a financial burden on a large section of the population that maybe we would want to encourage to become law law enforcement. Yeah, and it would just depend or, de depend on how you would go about doing it. I think collaborating with some of the community colleges where you know law enforcement has resources to bring in educators from those community college colleges to teach those type of aspects that they're lacking. You know, the police department has data on the deficiencies in their training. If you take that data <coughs> and then find a solution for those deficiencies, we can bridge the gap. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I think
think that's it. Thank you so much for being here. Hate to be the one last for lunchtime, right? Thank well, you. let's see if you are last. Are there <laughs> any other uh, people who are wishing to testify in the neutral capacity? Last call, neutral capacity. As Senator McKinney is coming up, I'll let you know that for the record, we've received 15 letters, 10 which were in support, and five in opposition. Thank you. Um, thank you for those who came in support, opposed, and in neutral. Um, I think it's important to note that everybody that was opposed was white. And it gets at where I'm, where I'm trying to get to. Uh, black people, people of color have been brutalized by the police since the first slave patrols in this country. And every time we stand up to ask for some real accountability, a bunch of white people stand up and say no, or it's too far, or you're, or you're doing too much. But they don't think about the trauma that we have to live through on the daily in our communities because police and people that claim they are allies stand up and say no to what we are asking for. Um, the, the oversight, whatever advisory committee in Omaha is a, is a mess. One, they're appointed by the mayor. You have people on the mayor staff on the board. The mayor has a close relationship with the police department in Omaha. I find a lot of conflicts of interest there and biases that will arise. Police don't want Brady List to be public because it's inaccurate and doesn't have due process. My same argument is the same one for gang lists. Un inaccurate, no due process, and no clear way to get off those lists. So you don't want Brady List public because you believe they're inaccurate. I don't want gang lists because they're inaccurate. Y'all don't want people to go, to go to school for degrees, but just imagine if I graduate a high school I apply at Emmanuel Hospital in Omaha and say I want to be a surgeon. Everybody will look at me like I'm crazy. But being a surgeon, you're put in a position where you could between life or death in those situations. Police are in a position to kill somebody, and we're telling them you don't need to go get further education. That is a problem. And honestly, if it dilutes the pool of applicants, I am supremely happy. One, because hopefully we weed out the races. And two, and, and you're arguing about diversity. Police forces are already not diverse. They're already weeding out black individuals that go to the academy for basic things like not being able to pass the math portion of the test. So don't come in here and talk about diversity. Because if you really wanted diversity in law enforcement, we would have it. And I'm, I'm just honestly just fed up with just the conversation, honestly. I mean, it's clear police want to police themselves because they want to police themselves. They want to have committees or oversight committees where all officers could be on there so officers can scare and intimidate people who are on there from actually doing what they're supposed to do and holding police accountable. It's it's so crazy and it, it's just, it's not eye-opening, it's just, you know, more clarification that people don't care about black people in America, especially when it comes to police relationships with black people. And that is the problem here. There will be another Tyree Nichols, there'll be another Amir Locke, there'll be another Breonna Taylor, there'll be another Michael Brown, and so on until y'all step up and we step up to actually pass things that hold them accountable and be transparent about it. And if y'all don't want that to happen, just sign up to fund every funeral for every black man and woman and kid killed by police over these next years, because that's what's gonna happen. Thank you. Are there any questions for Senator McKinney? Do not see any. With that, we will close the hearing on LB 284 and this morning's hearings.